Happy New Year and welcome back to Revenge of the Drive-In. We've got an exciting episode here today with two fourth entries to long-running classic horror series <laughs> and they are of course friday the 13th the final chapter and not saw the final chapter but that is a film <laughs> i think that's the ninth in the series we've got saw four i'm your host patrick and i'm joined here by jim hello everybody happy new year everybody happy new year patrick Good times, good times. I also want to say, it's funny, the first Friday the 13th came out in, what, 1980? And this one came out in 1984, so that's four movies in four years, and they thought that this was going to be the end. Well, it, it's five years. Okay, yeah. You, you, did, you did the thing that people always do that pisses me off. <laughs> 19, so 1980 is one year, 81 is two years, 82 is three, 83 is four, 84 is five people always do that because they just see like a difference of four years but no you have to account of the actual years so oh my goodness you're, you're wrong right. there was no friday the 13th in 1983 however saw was on a kick of a movie every year for a while i think the first seven or eight are back-to-back years i think i think 2004 to 2010 there is a saw movie every single year which oh is amazing <laughs> i don't know if we're ever going to see that again <laughs> i hope not to be honest Friday the 13th, the final chapter. We're starting with that one. Jim, you and I have seen this movie together a long time ago. (laughs) Yes, many moons ago. Arguably the best film in the Friday the 13th series. It's directed by Joseph Zito, who did The Prowler, which is a movie that you and I both enjoyed. We paired that with Friday the 13th Part 3, actually. Uh The Prowler, of course, incredible effects work by Tom Savini, who... This is only the second Friday the 13th film that he's ever been involved with, the second and last, because he did the original, the effects for the original, of course. And the reason they got him back for this one, because apparently he wasn't big on doing sequels, he would kind of just jump around and like, oh, a low-budget slasher movie is being made. Sure, I'll do uh, the effects for The Prowler or The Burning. Well, I guess, I guess he did Dawn of the Dead and Day of the Dead, if you count those sequels, so he was he stuck around with Romero, but... The, they lure him back by telling him, this is the last Friday the 13th movie. You get to kill Jason. And that was... <laughs> I mean, he does. He does kill Jason. It's worth noting that Jason definitively dies in this movie. The next time we see him, he is resurrected. So, yes, Jason does die in this film. This could have been the last in the series. But then they realized, hey, you know what would make more money? Another Friday the 13th movie. Yeah, and it's interesting to note that I believe after this one, and maybe maybe the trend had already been going on, each one is making less and less money. They're still wildly profitable because they're not made for much money. This has a reported budget of about $2 million, and this is, it made like $35 million or something. So, you know, it's still a sizable hit, not like a blockbuster by any means. But And it's also worth noting kind of when this comes out in the midst of the slasher craze, right? In the early 80s, everyone's making slasher movies. They're all over the place. They're major hits, even like borderline amateur productions are successful. Like Sleepaway Camp was a successful film, believe it or not. And that's <laughs> oh and that feels like it's made by kids at that camp. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's just the the power of just how appealing slashers were at this time part of it is the kind of the taboo nature of them you have people like siskel and ebert and i'm sure every kid's parents like railing against them Mm -hmm. 84 i think we kind of see a shift too and i think we we now i think kind of think of the 80s oh there's just slashers all everywhere all the time and that's not really true i think they're mostly in the early 80s and then the ones that continued were connected to a series for the most part. You don't see as many original slasher movies after 84. 84, of course, is the year of A Nightmare on Elm Street, which is kind of that last one in, kind of riding off the coattails of the original Halloween, which kind of started this. So you see Elm Street, you see Halloween, you see Friday the 13th movies continue throughout the decade, but you don't see as many The Prowlers and The Burnings and Sleepaway Camps. Like, well, actually, there were Sleepaway Camps sequels in the late 80s, (laughs) come to think of it. But would you say that most of the slasher type movies that came out were more based around kind of like a gimmick, like like a slasher in space, like Alien or something like that? You know what I mean? That's a good, good thought. I haven't really thought of that, but I do think A Nightmare on Elm Street kind of opened the door for 
a slasher with a personality or the supernatural slasher, i.e. Child's Play, comes out in 88. It's a while later, but I think that's kind of inspired by Nightmare on Elm Street because there's a supernatural story. There's a killer who's swearing and cracking jokes, you know, maybe more of an inspiration from some of the sequels, perhaps, of A Nightmare on Elm Street. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that could be. That's valid in my eyes. Well, because even stuff like Hellraiser. Right? I mean, yeah, I, I don't think of Hellraiser as a slasher movie. I think I did as a kid before I saw it because you would see Pinhead with Chucky and with Freddy and like these slasher icons. But I don't think, I don't know, I, I wouldn't really consider Hellraiser a slasher movie. Hellraiser 3 might be, but that's 1992, so we're getting ahead of ourselves there. That's a, we're, We've got Candyman at that point, so it's, <laughs> it's a different world in 92. All this having been said, okay. So let's start off the movie, uh, like I said, directed by Joseph Zito, makeup effects by Tom Savini, an all-star cast in so much as there has been an all-star cast for the Friday the 13th series, right? We got Crispin Glover doing crazy Crispin Glover stuff. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) We've got Corey Feldman. This is one of the early roles for Corey Feldman. He's, um, because like the Goonies and stuff comes afterwards. And of course, Corey Feldman was a pretty big child star of this time and i think of of his contemporaries you know think of sean astin like just think of like the guys that are in the goonies and and kind of the child actors in in those kinds of movies around that time i think he might be the best one uh now that doesn't mean to say he went on to be a good actor yeah i mean i otherwise but because like sean astin rudy lord of the rings like he's obviously at least a decent actor but i i think cory feldman was a better kid actor yeah, and, and and I think with actual with actual actors in this movie, this Friday the Thirteenth feels like an actual production. You know what I mean? Like it, it feels like an actual movie almost, where the other ones just feel like a bunch of people hanging out in the woods for the most part. <laughs> but you know? now here's the thing: this also thinks it feels like that at times, but because that's what's being depicted. But I think I know what you mean. The first Friday the Thirteenth movie is just like a handful of actors. We're out in the woods. We don't even have the enough money to like properly light some of these scenes. Like that's actually what I really like about the original Friday the Thirteenth. The night scenes are shot in the dark. Like normally, you know, and you can shoot night and light it in a way where it still conveys that it's night and that it's dark, but you mm-hmm. can actually see stuff. The original Friday the Thirteenth. There's like a few scenes where like Brenda's wandering out because she hears a voice, and it's like you can't see it fucking thing and and that's just because that's what that's what it was it's authentic that's i i actually appreciate that i think the original friday the 13th at least in that way benefits from its low budget friday the 13th part two feels a lot like the first one just a little bit more professionally done and then the third one is just i mean it's kind of a joke of a movie we we, we don't yeah. like the third one no we, we don't like we the really third don't. one this movie opening up with like actual good actors i mean i i don't know any of the actors names but the um cops or like the ambulance people or whatever the coroner. you know yeah the coroner <laughs> the coroner is hilarious <laughs> well he's great the coroner is is from seinfeld he plays the rabbi in a couple episodes of seinfeld oh does he really <laughs> <laughs> this movie feels like it has an actual budget behind it i guess and then all the all the family stuff you know the family in the cabin kind of stuff well, you say cabin it's just their house yeah all the family <laughs> Yeah, family hanging out in their house. If you, I don't know, it just <laughs> Abe like Lincoln's actual, old house. <laughs> yeah, well, there's like an actual story here. There's eh, actual character development. I don't, I don't know if I agree with this. I agree with the character development. That's that's the thing. This you can still have the same complaint that you have in other movies and say, oh, the characters kind of suck because they're not the best characters in the world. There is development, at least with some of them. You know, these are, at the end of the day, with many of the characters, because we get, we get two groups here. We get the family, which is three people and a dog that commits suicide later in the film, I think. <laughs> you know, so that family, that stuff's fun. Single mother or separated mother. Teenage girl who isn't thrilled about living in the middle of nowhere and, and mm-hmm. is kind of, like, really excited the second she sees, like, any teen over. And then you've got young boy... Corey Feldman, who's obsessed with making, like, horror monster masks who's, and stuff. Who's Tom Savini with the exact same haircut? Yes. <laughs> is, is that Tom Savini's haircut? I, I don't know. But I watched an old interview of him, and that's, like, his exact same okay. kind of ugly bowl cut sort of thing. Well, I, I mean, I agree with the he is Tom Savini. That is the reason they named him Tommy. They did. And this is before they had Tommy uh, or Tom Savini 
signed on to do the film, they kind of wanted to pay tribute to him in some way. And I assume it ended up being Tom Savini making those masks and stuff, I assume. Oh, it must have been, right? So we've got the two groups. So we've got that group, which feels pretty real, the three of them. And then we've got the other group, which is kind of the same group that we see in the other series. It's just teens that want to go and have sex, pretty much. <laughs> but But I think the fact that we get these two groups, I think that lends a different angle to the film than we've had so far a little bit there's just a little bit more going on there's not much more yeah but it feels different the biggest problem with this series is that most films feel exactly the same way and and even this film does to a certain extent because it's it's the same kind of music i've listened to all the friday the 13th scores extensively because i put a lot of the tracks on my halloween playlists and stuff and and I, i i admit they all sound pretty much the same i do think this is one of the better scores Friday the 13th 4, 6, and 2 probably have the best Harry Manfredini scores in the series. I'll believe you. I believe you. Yeah, oh yeah. I don't expect anyone to be able to confirm <laughs> nor, nor, nor refute that. Yeah. Three times before, you have felt the terror, known the madness, lived the horror. But this is the one you've been screaming for. (gasps) Friday, the 13th, the final chapter. Jason is back. All right, so the movie begins with another montage. Although this one's at least kind of fun. This is like a greatest hits montage. (laughs) Because in the the past we started just kind of the last scene of the last movie. This one, we get a little intercut between the campfire story that Paul from part two shares about Jason, which was a really good scene. And then we get that kind of cut with scenes of Jason wreaking havoc. And it's mostly scenes from the third one because that's when he has the hockey mask. And at this point, this is the first film in which he has the hockey mask from the beginning. The ho- We know people like the hockey mask. We know it's famous. We know it's iconic. So we're going to, you know, the bag over the head. That would just confuse people, right? <laughs> yeah. Who's that? hobo who's that clansman <laughs> who's that, in, in the who's woods? that Who is big that guy? tall muscular hobo <laughs> yeah i mean i mean the reason you have this scene is so someone can jump into this and have it be the first film that they see in the series in that sense you want to get them introduced not just to jason the name but jason the look the hockey mask because that's the look he has here and all of his exploits his greatest hits like you said up to this point, of course, because a lot of his greatest hits are yet to come. Many of them come in this film. And, you know, that, that's one thing that, that's great about the series. Even in the weaker movies, he's got great moments. Like, Jason X is not a great movie, but that has, like, <laughs> two or three of the best Jason things ever in it. So, And also on that note, too, I will say that I, I think this is a perfectly fair movie. This, this actually might be my recommendation if someone's never seen a Friday the 13th movie. I might tell them to start with this. You know, I, I, I like the first film for what it is, but Friday the 13th became synonymous with Jason. So you watch that movie and you're like, huh? Is yeah, that, I mean, it, 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 it would literally Jason just confuse that? people if you had them start with the first one. It might. But yeah, anyways. So after that, we go back to the scene at the end of the third one. Or I mean, it, this is new footage here. But Jason's dead in the barn. Dana Kimmel, Chris, hit him in the head with the axe, which I like. Pretty much the rest of the series sticks with that consistent axe mark in the mask, which is great. Absolutely, they didn't need to. I don't think anyone would have complained if they <laughs> had gotten rid of that. To the point where it's actually like Jason's mask is destroyed in the seventh film. He picks up a new mask in the beginning of the eighth one. It still has the axe mark. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand it. I don't understand how or why. That's amazing. But it does, yeah. So so Jason's dead in the barn. The cops are, you know, they say something like there's no survivors, which, I don't know, did Chris's ambulance crash into a tree on the way <laughs> to the hospital or something? Because there definitely was a survivor. But I, I like this scene. There's This scene, like, opens like, oh, my God, we have a budget for the first time in this series. Like, there's, like, a helicopter. Things are well lit. And then I like how, as everyone's going away, these ambulances, police cars, helicopters are going away. It's just kind of quiet. For like a brief moment, like five seconds maybe. And it's yeah. just a shot of the barn. These are the touches that Joseph Zito brings to this film that I don't think other directors in the series have really brought. And and they're easily overlooked. 
But if if you're looking for reasons, if you're like me and you've seen all these movies a bunch of times and you're looking for reasons of how does one movie stand out from the crowd, it's little moments like that, I think. And then it's also Crispin Glover dancing. But <laughs> yeah, there's other ways this film stands out too, but it's little things like that. Oh, this is made by a filmmaker who knows what he's doing. It's just like something eerie about how everything just goes silent there. Yeah, it was also great because it was kind of like closing the last chapter. And That's true. Yeah, I wasn't thinking you know, it was that fade way. to black. It's over. Then over at the morgue, one of the girls is brought in. So we're introduced to this coroner named Axel, who, like I said, the rabbi in Seinfeld. He's he's a fucking creep from the beginning. He's a sex pest. <laughs> he's a sex pest. He watches aerobic porn later no it's killer workout please but it, it pretty much is but yeah that's actually like really interesting i i've seen a video i don't remember what it was, what it was called but someone did the research and found out what that was and it was like something the beautiful workout and it's like it kind of did sound like it was like soft core <laughs> aerobics so i don't know but anyways uh. he has we kind of introduced to him he's like eating a donut he places it like on top of the body you know it's he's comedy coroner guy and he says something about it i was like oh a real cute girl and the cop's like she was and he's like oh she still is just go over there and take a look like okay he's a sex best he's a creepy weirdo he's also comic relief <laughs> he's also a slob and yeah. for some reason this nurse that's there is like kind of into him Kind, I say kind of because she doesn't seem to be, but then she still makes out with him later. And then when it's interrupted, then she's like, oh, what was I thinking? So <laughs> it's just him and it's just the nurse. They're watching the TV, the news of the report of the, all the murders and stuff. And they're like, the person who did these murders is now at the whatever county coroner. And it's like, OK. And then uh, when they're making out Jason's arm, which is like right behind them, falls out of of the table and kind of brushes against them. The coroner freaks out. And then that's when the nurse freaks out and just kind of leaves. So then he goes back to watching his aerobic porn. <laughs> I mean, how else can you describe it though? No, I that's mean, exactly what, what it is. It's lots isn't of, it amazing uh, that whatever, th- whatever this is, you, you would think you would think that whatever he's watching, they just made for this movie because it doesn't seem like it was a real thing. And apparently it was again, not a hundred percent sure what it is. Yeah, anyways, Jason comes to, well, actually, there's a, when he puts Jason in the little, the drawer, whatever that is. Yeah, the cold you, storage. You've worked at a morgue. What is that? It's like a cold storage. It's it's, okay. it's a refrigerator. When he puts him in the cold storage, there's a neat shot where you see breath come out of Jason. Like, yeah. as he's closing it, because it's shot from within. So they don't, so he doesn't see it, but Jason breathes. This is our first indication that Jason's alive, because, you know, the arm could have happened for any number of reasons. That shot was actually accomplished. Ted White plays Jason. I don't know if this was Ted White in this scene, though, but whoever plays the dead body, whether it was Ted White or whoever, what he did was he inhaled, like, a huge breath of cigarette smoke and just kind of held it until they closed that door and then just breathed it out. Because if if he just breathed, you wouldn't be able to see it. It had to be darker. Yeah. It had to be thicker. So that's that's, (laughs) it's a neat shot. Then Jason comes to, grabs Axel, takes, a like, a hacksaw and twists his head like backwards like exorcist style yeah it's it's pretty impressive like he slits his throat and then he like partially slits his throat and then just twists his head yeah it, it's brutal and one thing i'll say by and large this movie has very good kills for the series it's, again tom savini he knows how to kill people <laughs> <laughs> right that's I'll, i say that with all due respect i have heard that this as as is the case with many friday the 13th movies and many slasher movies in general especially some of the bigger studio ones mpaa not a big fan. Uh, and they were trying to get them <laughs> to cut a bunch of stuff. He's like, hey, you're close to an X rating. And the agreement that they had, or agreement, the the thing that they, I don't know if it was Tom Savini, if it was Joe Cicito, or producer Frank Mancuso Jr., someone is like, we'll keep editing it. We'll take out like literally like a couple frames each time. We'll send it back till they get an R. The thing that they were adamant about, though, we need to keep as much of Jason's death as we can. That is the line we're drawing. We are letting Jason's head slide down that machete. We need that. And it's like, oh, that's kind of neat. And and I think that pays off. That's like one of my favorite moments ever later on. And we'll get to it, obviously. But yeah. So then Jason goes and also stabs with the scalpel and just goes up with it like he's opening her chest. Ugh, yeah. Which we see in the next movie. Opening scene. (laughs) Opening scene, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, a lot of coroner stuff. A lot of coroner stuff in, in these two movies. So... 
After that, we meet our two groups of characters. We have the Jarvis family, which I mentioned, separated mother, but we've got Mrs. Jarvis. We've got Tommy, who is, of course, Corey Feldman. We were introduced to him wearing, like, a creepy alien bug mask while he's playing, like, Atari or something, or NES or whatever he's playing. <laughs> yeah. I think it's Atari. I think this is before NES. And then Trish is the older sister. So Trish is probably about 17 or 18. And it, one thing I like about both these characters, Trish and Tommy, one, they they seem to have a good relationship between the two. They have a good relationship with the mom, too. Like, this is a this seems like a close family. But what I really like is the movie does a really good job of kind of capturing how lonely those two are. And, you know, the mom's probably lonely, too, but we just don't get into it. But, like, they live in the middle of nowhere. They live in the woods. They don't meet a lot of people their age. And so when when when, when the teens come over, Trish is, like, really excited. And then when she meets Rob later, she's also excited. But, like, Tommy's super excited to meet Rob, too, because he never has friends over. And he's like, let me show you my room. That's really good. It's even kind of sad because I think early on in the movie when, um, when uh, the mother, I forget her name, I don't know if she has a name. She's just Mrs. Jarvis to me. When Mrs. Jarvis says, hey, there's a bunch of kids moving in, and Tommy's like, oh, wow, really? This is so exciting. But, you know, they're all like 16, 18, whatever. You know, they don't want to hang out with some loser who makes masks in his bedroom. The reverse is also true. He makes he makes masks alone in his bedroom because he, like, doesn't have people he could be hanging out with, right? Yes, Probably. Yeah. Good characterization here for these for these two kids, I think. Kids, you know. Trish is 18. She, Trish, Trish looks older, too. Kimberly well, Patrick, Pack. let's be honest. At this point, they are kids compared to us. You know what I mean? Yeah, but only barely. She was born in 56. She's like she's like 28 years old in this movie. She's That's oh, like okay. your age. You're like, what, 29? <laughs> yeah, 29. Yeah. <laughs> so we also meet the teens, the partying teens. There's... there's a lot of characters here. Let me let's let's try and because they all they're they're relative. Some of them are relatively well developed. They they have their little character quirks and stuff, and I think they're all acted fairly well. The big one obviously is Jimmy or Jimbo, as he's often called. That's Crispin <laughs> Glover. He kind of just plays Crispin Glover. Like there's a similarity between him in this movie and him in Back to the Future, right? Because Back to the Future, he's just a fucking loser. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 his role in Back to the Future is, I mean, Michael J. Fox is trying to get him to be less of a loser. Oh that is pretty much what's going on between Jimbo and Teddy, played by Lawrence Monison, star of the canon sex comedy, The Last American Virgin, which <laughs> I mentioned that because that's actually an amazing movie. That's actually like a really good movie. Like it's a sex comedy, but it ends up being... It almost has like the poignancy of like an Alexander Payne film, like in the latter half. Like that, the movie goes in kind of unexpected directions. He's the lead in that. I, I that's the only other thing I've seen him in here. But Teddy's annoying. There, there's no other way to describe it. He's annoying, and he um, <laughs> he's big on um. So Jimmy Jimbo had had some relationship with B J Becky, I think is what they refer to her as. They they broke mm-hmm. up and. Jimbo is all like in his head about like oh I, I don't know what could have happened and then he's uh, Teddy's like here's what happened you're a dead fuck and that's <laughs> like the repeating line or the repeating joke and I like it because it's like it's it, it has it has layers to it, it it's, it's layers to its meaning right like we're obviously over. talking we're talking about sexual prowess maybe mm-hmm. he's bad at sex right that's ultimately what it is but also like dead fuck like I don't know he's just a and especially it's like you're seeing him. He's just boring. He's just a loser. You're like you don't want to spend time around him. <laughs> Wait till he dances. <laughs> and then on top of that, yeah, that's the thing. Then on top of that, this is a slasher movie. We know what dead means. We know, we know what what it could mean here, and that's exactly what happens eventually. So who are the other characters? Barbara Howard is Sarah, and she's a virgin. <laughs> Can you just? That's that's her. That's her character thing. I know, but she's can you the, clip that? She, because it's... <laughs> that's well, maybe. Great. So she's the last American virgin in this film. <laughs> and she's best friends with Samantha, or Sam, played by Judy Aronson, star of American Ninja and Weird Science, I think. Gorgeous woman. They're best friends, but she apparently has a reputation, but really she's monogamous, or at least appears to be. So Barbara's like, okay, like, listen, you have sex all the time. Like, what am I doing wrong? And she's like, I don't have sex all the time. I just have sex with Paul or whatever. I, right, I think she mentions the name Paul, which is, which is important because there's two other guys here. 
Alan Hayes is Paul. He is Judy Aronson's boyfriend. He really ultimately doesn't have much of a character. And then there's Doug, who's the guy that Barbara really likes, who's an absolutely gorgeous man, best looking guy in the cast. I forget, is that the guy in the skinny, in the uh, in the jean shorts? I don't remember what they wear. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just I, I remember how they die. Paul's the one who gets stabbed in the dick with a, uh, with a <laughs> harpoon. And <laughs> Doug is the one whose head gets crushed against a shower wall. So I, this is, oh, yes, yeah, okay. here's the thing. We're, <laughs> we're going into detail on the characters as much as we can, because there are, there is some characterization here as opposed to some other movies of this kind. But ultimately you do kind of remember them for how they die. That's probably the easiest method. These are the characters. They're all moving into the cabin next door to the driver's house. Not like moving in, but they're renting it for the weekend or whatever. They're just going to party, have sex, watch old silent porn. I'm not really (laughs) sure the game plan, but they end up going out to the lake one day. And that's when they run into twins. And these were the double mint twins in uh, television commercials. But they are Camilla and Carrie Moore who, again, gorgeous. They look exactly the same, so I'm not going to know which one is which. But these are Tina and Terry, apparently. Obviously, any guy in this group who's not paired up, which is Teddy, Jimbo, and Doug, are, like, into them immediately. But they go to the (laughs) lake and they go skinny dipping. There's two people that are hesitant to skinny dip. One is Barbara, because she's a virgin. Oh, no, Sarah. Sorry, Barbara's the actress. God. Again, these yeah, these That's okay. I, I Just joke call her Sarah these characters. The S the V. Baby. These characters aren't that memorable, but at the same time, they're more memorable than any characters in the other Friday the Thirteenth movies. So it's like I gotta <laughs> pay them respect. And then Jimbo doesn't want to skinny dip because he's like, oh no, we have no suit. And <laughs> again, because this is a loser thing to do. This is he doesn't want it. Well, I, I I should say I guess they're not skinny dipping yet. They just kind of go in, in the water. But this is the dead fuck thing to do. I don't have a suit. I can't go swimming when really you got two naked twins out there. You gotta you gotta you gotta, you gotta strip and dip. Yeah, <laughs> strip and dip. <laughs> Trish and Tommy actually come across them as they're skinny dipping. Tommy ends up kind of running into them because he's chasing after Gordon, their golden retriever. And then he's, you know, amazed at what he sees. And <laughs> Trish <laughs> tries to cover his eyes. But then when they get back in the car, do you remember the line he says? He's like, some, some, oh, some pack of patootsies, I think. He has some, like, weird way of describing tits. <laughs> like, I don't know. Yeah, I, but I again, this is, he's a kid. He doesn't hang out with other kids his age. He doesn't, he doesn't know what to call him. He, he doesn't know the word bazongas. So the car breaks down, Trish and Tommy's car, and this is where we're introduced to, like, Tommy is actually a pretty capable little boy. We've already seen he makes the masks and stuff, but he kind of knows what he's doing with fixing the car, although ultimately he's unable to fix it. And that's when we meet Rob, who comes up to them. He claims to be a hunter hunting bears, although Tommy points out, no, it's, I, I don't, I don't know if the problem is it's not bear season or there are no bears out here, but Tommy knows he's lying. Rob starts asking a lot of questions that I guess, I guess he doesn't think sound creepy, but <laughs> to me watching and even knowing where the movie goes with the Rob character, they, the questions sound very creepy. He's like, are there any kids around here? And the woods, <laughs> what the fuck is he, what is he doing? <laughs> it's like, can we rephrase this please? But yeah, so it's revealed later. Rob is hunting for Jason. Did you catch who his sister is? Because his sister was killed by Jason uh, a couple no, I, movies ago. Was it, hold on, was it the girl who was killed in her apartment and her head was put in the fridge? Was it that one? No, that's that's Alice. That's a good guess. And that would make more sense than this. Okay, so another thing worth pointing out about this series. Friday the 13th Part 2 presumably takes place on Friday. Friday the 13th Part 3, the next day. <laughs> this movie, the day after that, so Sunday the 15th, his sister was killed two days ago, and oh. he's already hunting for Jason, so it's just, just kind of weird. But his sister was the underage girl who got impaled with her boyfriend having sex in the second movie. Oh, okay. It ultimately doesn't matter. I, I almost half expect the filmmakers to think you're jumping into this movie. Oh, his yeah, his sister got killed by Jason years ago or something. Like it's a, they, they they like they named the character. It doesn't really matter. They they they're not expecting you to think of, "Hey, that was 48 hours ago. What, what's with this?" <laughs> but but yeah, it doesn't really make sense when you when you actually think about it. But again, it doesn't matter. 
And then he also reveals later, because when he mentions, like, oh, Jason's out there, we got to kill him. Trish is like, well, Jason's, he's dead. He's in the morgue. And then he's like, oh, he escaped from the morgue. It's like, oh, that's actually, why didn't anyone else know that? Yeah. And I, like, has Mrs. Even Jarvis been, watched has the news? broadcast at that point? Yeah. yeah. Well, and it might have, but I, I don't expect the kids to be watching the news, you know, the, the teenagers next door. But I feel like Mrs. Jarvis should be on top of that. Well, yeah, th- there was even a line at the beginning when uh, she yeah, was she's like, like, like you got to lock the door. What if what yeah. if the psycho comes by? And I don't yeah. remember if she says the psycho or a psycho. A psycho. A psycho. OK, so it's not Jason specifically, just any psycho in the woods. Well, also, are they even at Crystal Lake in this movie? Or is this just like a random house irrelevant? Irrelevant question. Okay. I, it doesn't matter. I mean, they go. We do see Thanks, a professor. lake. I well, it, it's, we see a lake. What do you? What more do you need? I, I just like how you answered that. Irrelevant. Irrelevant question. It, it's irrelevant because it's like okay, they're not actually at the camp of the original camp. Neither was yeah. the second one. It was a different camp. Yeah, this one's on the same lake too. You know, it's just some. Yeah, else. yeah. I mean, that's what I was wondering. Of these first four movies, I think the Friday the Thirteenth Part Three doesn't feel like it's in the same location of of the first four. Yeah, well, is this the is this the first movie that's actually filmed in California, as opposed to the other three that were filmed in like New York State? Well, okay, the first one's filmed in New, New Jersey. The that's second it. one, I'm not sure where that's filmed. The third one is California, and I think this is California as well. So, I, I it, the question comes down to where the second one's filmed, and I don't really know. I don't think it's California, but I also don't think it's Jersey. It might be like Virginia, Connecticut. I don't really know. But at any rate, we were skipping over. There's a, a charming scene when Tommy is tucked into bed, blinds open, and he sees he sees at the neighboring house Sam and Paul getting it on, and he gets really excited, and he's just kind of jumping around in his bed because when you're a kid, what it's exciting. You're you're not really sure what you don't know what to do, right? <laughs> Yeah. you're having feelings <laughs> you don't know what they mean he's just really excited and then the mom comes in notices that lowers the blinds but of course he's pretending he's asleep when the mom comes in so there's like a shot or two of the mom like looking out the window at those teens like disapprovingly it ultimately doesn't doesn't add to anything but i think the idea was like that's kind of how this started this started with a mom being pissed off at oh. teens for having sex. N- not necessarily to imply that she would kill someone, yeah, yeah, yeah. but just like that it just says like a callback almost. That is an interesting uh, way of looking at that. I guess I guess we also missed this is before the teens even arrive at their little vacation home. We get another Jason kill. This this poor fat girl who <laughs> Who says Canada and and love or something? In Canada and love, yeah. She's got a uh, a sign that says she's hitchhiking, trying to go to Canada. And then they make fun of her. And so as they drive off, she switches. <laughs> she flips the sign back and she just says, fuck you, written on the other <laughs> side, which is great. It's like she was prepared. For it. She was prepared yeah. to be heckled. <laughs> but then the poor girl, when she's eating her banana, gets stabbed in the back of the neck by Jason. And it's a neat effect, the knife coming through the front. Is this is this like the first? I guess it probably isn't. But this movie, there's like a lot of needless Jason kills. He 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 has killed people who aren't teenagers banging or teenagers on yeah. on the lake before. But like this is the first one where like I think the first three people he kills are people who essentially have nothing to do with with whatever Jason's about. You know, it's the coroner, yeah. the lady. Yeah. Well, we we talked about this with the third one. I argue. And it's a half-hearted argument because I can talk myself out of it as easily as talking myself into it. But I argue that the third one is the first in the series to create characters merely to be killed off, Mm -hmm. i.e. the bikers. Yes. However, the bikers do have an effect on the other characters because they do siphon the gas. So that's why there's an asterisk on that. Yes, the bikers are really just there to get killed and to, to show Jason jason's strength give him a few more bodies to collect and then also the main biker guys is like big tough guy like you see jason kill him it's like okay you know what's gonna stop him right yeah well and and they actually show up to the place where all the well and that's the thing and and, and also the main biker guy shows up at the end because he wasn't quite dead but he ultimately doesn't impact the story at that point he just gets his arm cut off and killed immediately but yeah this movie, the hitchhiker is the big one, I think, uh, because you have the coroner and then and the nurse. That's just the initial stuff. That's just Jason getting on the move. That's just him escaping. Mm-hmm. So the big one is the hitchhiker. 
there is an argument to be made that this is the first character in the Friday the 13th series who is truly created just to get killed. It has no impact on anything. Yeah. Well, so uh, in that sense, I agree with you, but I would say Friday 3 is, is moving in that direction. Now, isn't it also interesting that if this had been like a Halloween movie, everybody in that hospital would have been killed as Michael Myers walking out the front door? You know, I was just kind of thinking like... Well, which era of Halloween movies, though? Yeah, I guess... Because like, I agree, if it's if it's Halloween Kills, there's no way we're not killing at least a dozen people in that scene. Yeah, what's the one where there's where he's actually in the hospital? Is that H2O? No, Halloween 2, he's in the hospital. And then also one of the Rob Zombie ones, he's in the hospital. And then also Resurrection, he goes to the hospital to kill Jamie Lee Curtis. But I think she's the only one. I mean, there might be like another dead body or something. But I think that's a somewhat limited. But... but it's Halloween Resurrection. It's one of the worst movies ever made, so who cares? <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I, I remember there's like a hospital massacre, I think, in Rob Zombie's 2007 Halloween, maybe. I, I do yeah. kind of remember that. Yeah, there's like dead nurses and, and the and the dead clerk and stuff. Yeah, I think there's a scene where he stabs, he stabs someone like 15 times and it's like the most excessive thing and i found myself <laughs> laughing and I, I think that's i think that's in that hospital i think it's like someone at a desk he just stabs her she's like clearly dead and then he just keeps going and going <laughs> and going and i'm like what were we going for if not comedy in this moment i have no idea that rob zombie you know he's not an awful filmmaker but he makes some he does some things it's just like i'm not really sure i'm not sure what he's going for here <laughs> I, I, I confess, I don't really know what, what I'm supposed to be feeling. <laughs> and then, okay, so so this is after the skinny dipping. The twins come home with the teens. Also, if you notice, the, the twins are British, the actresses. They pretty much have a British accent here. They don't do a great job of hiding that, even though they're just local. Yeah, whoever, yes, you I know. did notice. They're wearing the worst, baggiest clothes in the world. They're wearing, like, MC Hammer pants. <laughs> And matching outfits, too, right? Yeah, of course, because they're twins. If there's one thing the internet has taught me about twins, and I'm just thinking of, like, the people that are, like, on TikTok and YouTube and stuff who are basically just famous for being twins. They'll just post videos about them being twins. They always dress exactly the same and do their hair exactly the same. And it's like, you guys do have personalities, right? Like, this isn't your only... Like, I know this is just for views, but please tell me you're not like this every day. Yeah, I mean, it's just like Danny DeVito and Arnold uh, Schwarzenegger. Yes, good point. Just like I'm (laughs) looking in a mirror. (laughs) This is, of course, the famous dancing scene. So they they wanted... Everyone wants to dance. Crispin Glover puts a record on. It's like a heavy metal (laughs) record, which already... It's like, okay, how do you dance to that? And then, well, we see how you dance to that because he just goes fucking nuts. (laughs) Uh, of course, arguably the most famous scene in the movie. It's 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 a bit of a cult classic scene. I, I'm sure there are people who are not familiar with this movie who have seen this the dancing scene, and you know maybe they know what it's from, maybe they don't. It doesn't go on for too long, but it's from what I understand from like behind the scenes stuff I've heard people talking about or like retrospective documentaries. That was just how Crispin Glover danced. Like they they would like while they were shooting the movie, they would like go out partying, go out to like clubs and bars and stuff, and he danced like that, Jesus. which is amazing. Well, and and here's the thing too with Crispin Glover, fairly talented actor. Mm-hmm. Not saying he's like the best actor in the world, but a talented guy. But he is also kind of a crazy person. He's like a <laughs> bit of a Nick Cage. Uh, he's even crazier than Nick Cage, but Nick Cage is kind of like an eccentric weirdo who just happens to make a lot of movies where he's also an eccentric weirdo, but he also makes movies where he's just a normal person, too. Yeah, I don't know. It's just like the full Crispin Glover performance, and I do think this movie is an example of it. He just he makes weird choices that, at least in this movie and in like Back to the Future, benefit the movie because they enhance the character. And, and in this movie and Back to the Future, he's kind of just playing a loser, <laughs> so I'm thinking I'm thinking specifically back to the future like how he uh, laughs when he's watching uh, the honeymooners or something. Yes, yeah. Oh, 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 no. <laughs> Again, Crispin Glover is just like really good at like just weird stuff. Also a famous uh I know you love the uh Peter O'Toole Camel letterman story yes yeah a famous uh crispin glover i think it was letterman story he got on stage in character as a character that didn't exist oh, and 
I think he got like banned from ever being on that show again or something. And then like 20 years later, he did a movie where he played that character. And it's like, was he working on something the entire time? I don't know. He's no, a weird guy. No. He's a he's a weird guy. I think he might have. I think he's weird enough where that was a possibility. But anyways, Sam gets upset because her boyfriend, Paul, is kind of flirting with one of the twins. So Sam goes out. She's like, okay, fine. I'm going out to the lake. And she ends up skinny dipping by herself, which is, you know, it's also visibly pretty cold. And I guess she, I mean, she skinny dips, but she also, it's not, it's, it's not skinny dipping if you're in a raft. No. No, it's, she's not. It's, I think she is in the water at one point, but she's just hanging out in the raft. Again, I've heard from documentaries and stuff that it was fucking freezing, and, and Judy Aronson, like, I don't know if she got like pneumonia or something, but this was like a miserable shoot. This scene because it <laughs> is cold, and she is naked, and she's out there for a while, but she does get stabbed from underneath the raft, a bit like the Kevin Bacon death. And then later on, Paul goes out there to find her, and this is when he gets stabbed in the dick with the harpoon, and he gets lifted, which is just amazing (laughs) and really brutal. Dude, that would be the worst way to go. (laughs) Yeah, and meanwhile, while all this is happening, we've got the three single guys. They're all striking it up and striking out with these twins. Also, Sarah's there. Sarah's not interacting too much. But Teddy tries the same awful pickup line with uh, both twins at different times, which which is which I like. I like that it's just like this is what a sleazeball this guy is. But he's he's also like he's just as much a loser as Jimbo. He just doesn't realize it. Yeah, this is like yeah, Jimbo's he... at least sensitive. There's like something kind of like like I I've said this before when we talked about Friday the Thirteenth Part Three. Jimbo is Shelly without the woman hating part because Shelly's just like oh you bitch you rejected me like there's like there's a little bit of that incel energy with shelly jimbo <laughs> is like all of that where he's like kind of goofy kind of pathetic but i think i and you end up liking him more than you like shelly neither you nor i liked shelly some people do shelly's a bit of a fan favorite to some people some people say he's like the jar jar binks they're the wrong series. but anyways i wouldn't, go, I wouldn't yeah. go that far but teddy that's his name i don't know he's almost more of a loser than uh, crispin glover because like he is also like a Teddy kind of character. Like he he's like a jokester. He's like doing dumb jokes and but he doesn't. The he hand himself, coming out the fly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he himself doesn't realize that he's a loser. Yeah, you know? yeah. That's that's the thing. He's Jimbo seems to almost be the only one who tolerates him, and Jimbo's still annoyed to shit by him, but mostly because he's making fun of him. But anyways, we see more of these interactions. Uh, <laughs> there's a there's a really odd moment where they go into the kitchen, Jimbo and Teddy. Oh, is this the part with the hand through his fly? It, it is I, that part. I, but but I, I, before we get to that, there's a funny line, which does you'd think would be like consequential, especially because one of the twins walks in on him while he's saying it. But he's like, besides, you've got the hot one of the two, which I think is funny because they look exactly yeah. the same, yeah. exactly <laughs> down to the matching outfit um so imagine thinking one is hotter than the other like i don't know maybe if you <laughs> see them completely naked we might be able to make that determination but i also like in that scene when he's got his hand uh when teddy's got his hand through his fly and the camera pans or like it, it, it cuts to one of the twins standing there and it cuts back yeah. to uh the two actors standing there like uh, up against the sink and crispin glover's like he thinks this is funny he does this all the time <laughs> yeah he thinks this is a funny thing he's doing I'm a bit embarrassed to say, I don't know how many times I'd seen this movie before I noticed what he was doing with his hand. Oh. I, th- I, th- I always thought that was a weird line because I didn't realize he was, I thought he was just talking about like him laughing. And I'm like, what? That's a weird thing to say. Oh no, he's, he's dangling his fingers out his own fly. That's what he's doing. But yeah, anyways, so eventually Jimbo gets with one of the twins and they go upstairs, but then the other twin gets angry that she's that the that and again I'm saying I don't know which one's which so she gets angry I think that Jimbo's her sister Tina. okay so Terry gets pissed that Tina is having sex if you're right about those names <laughs> and then she's like ready to leave and it's just kind of a weird reaction because can't you wait twenty more minutes <laughs> it's like raining at this point she like throws on a raincoat and she's like as she's leaving she's like looks up at the window she's like you slut. <laughs> and then there's a really neat shot where she gets stabbed by like a pole or like a long stick of some sort, but it's all done in shadow. It's the silhouette on the outside of the house, which is really cool. But then her 
body is thrown against the the house mm-hmm. as well. I, I, I love that shot. That's a really, again, going back to Joseph Zito, a couple little touches that elevate this over most movies in the series. Because a lot of these movies have off-screen deaths, but this is at least a really creative way to shoot that. Yeah, it, it, it's almost like the director's directing. Whereas with the other movies, they've just pointed a they've camera just shot, at the yeah, point, you know? point and shoot direction a little bit. Yeah, this is a little bit more than that. I agree. It's not like, again, we're not saying this is Kubrick. <laughs> but for a slasher movie, I think it's very well done. Also, at one point, the mom, Mrs. Jarvis, who is home alone, sees something and like, or she goes outside in the rain and like screams, and then we never see her again. And also at one point, and I don't remember exactly when it is, I mentioned the dog might commit suicide. They The the implication is the dog is thrown out the window, right? Yeah. But <laughs> they include a few too many frames where you can see that the dog is jumping towards the window. Like if they made that a little bit shorter, it would have been more convincing. But yes, the shot starts too early. The dog is clearly jumping. <laughs> So R.I.P. Gordon, R.I.P. Mrs. Jarvis. And at this point, Teddy has found, and I don't know where he finds this, if this is just in the house, if he brought it with him. He seems to be really excited by, about, about it, so I assume he finds it. But I don't know why it's in this house. But it's old stag films. These are silent pornos, basically. <laughs> and he's And he hooks up a projector, and he's running this. And at this point, he's high. He and um, Doug are smoking weed, and he's enjoying this. This is this is, I think, when the twin is just like, "Yeah, what the fuck this? Like, this I'm not hanging around this loser." So that's when she wants to leave. Mm-hmm. But Doug is enjoying it for a while too. But then Sarah says she wants to go upstairs to bed with him. So she finally makes her move, and he's all for it. So then it's just Teddy alone watching this crap, and Teddy is eventually. The film becomes unspooled, and he's, like, going up to the projector, and he doesn't know what's going on, and he gets stabbed through the back, or through the projector screen. So Jimbo and whichever twin, they have sex. Then they're, like, cuddling after, and he's like, let me ask you a question. Was I a dead fuck? And she's like, no, you were wonderful. And then so he goes downstairs. He's got the panties. He's going to show them to... Or he does show them to Teddy. So this is, I guess, before Teddy dies. But then he goes to get a bottle of champagne, but he can't find the corkscrew, and it's because Jason has it. Jason stabs the corkscrew through his hand, like pinning him basically to this cutting board. Yeah. And then <laughs> at, right as right as he turns, he gets like a uh, meat cleaver to the forehead. It's all really brief, again, because I'm sure they cut it down, but you don't feel cheated. Mm-hmm. It's bloody. You get the great little twitching that Crispin Glover does with the cleaver in his forehead. You do not feel cheated. This is an awesome death. And then I suppose it's sometime after this that Teddy dies. Sarah and Doug have sex in the shower, which I'm just going to point this out here. If this is your first time having sex, because this is Sarah's first time we've established this. In the shower, you know, degree of difficulty, a little higher than than you'd probably want for a losing virginity. Yeah, and you know, I mean, I'm not going to get into specifics here, but if you ask women, shower sex, not that great. It's one of those things that sounds awesome in theory, but it's just like awkward and you're standing the entire... Like, it's just weird. It, it, it sounds cool. Yeah. In movies, it looks good. So they have sex. It's awesome. <laughs> and then uh, Doug starts singing and Sarah says, like, I think I'm in love. And then she realizes, like, oh, maybe I shouldn't say that. But then, then she gets out of the shower and throws on, like, a bathrobe or something. And then Doug, I guess, gets back into the shower, and this is where he's killed. And I love this scene. His face. Well, this is, like, really the first time we see Jason up close, like, yeah. with the mask and everything. And he's shoving his head against the wall, kind of covering his mouth. Yeah, it, it, it's just it's just brutal. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and then we get the cutaway to the fake head, which is awesome, because the head is just, like, bending into itself it's just being crushed against the wall blood falling on the ground really good stuff it doesn't tend to be brought up at least in my experience as one of the best kills of the series and i absolutely think it should then jason chases sarah around a bit but yeah so she's running around the house remaining clothed and eventually gets the axe thrown through the door into her chest yeah and it's pretty fucking awesome meanwhile we haven't talked about trish and tommy in a while and they've been out running errands they come back they don't know where the mom is. They don't know where Gordon is. And they're worried. So they actually go out looking for A, the mom, or B, maybe Rob, if he's around there somewhere. And Trish finds Rob's tent 
and he and she sees like the newspaper articles about Jason and stuff and then he comes back sees that his gun has been broken and so that this is where we get the full reveal that Rob is really out for revenge even though we don't even know who his sister is really and um, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't really make sense that but yeah, whatever. I mean, so then then they realize, okay, Jason is out here. Now we need to get back to Tommy because Tommy could be in trouble. So they go back and Tommy's okay. They tell him to lock the door. But at this point, now they go over to the neighbors or the neighboring house and, you know, they find dead bodies and Rob gets attacked in like the basement. I think they have to enter through the basement for some reason. Does that sound right? Yeah, I think think so i'm gonna be honest i had to skip over the last part of this movie i mean skim through it but i'll believe you but yeah so rob gets killed by jason there's some unfortunate dialogue where he's just like he's killing me he's killing me (laughs) jason has like a garden claw in this scene it doesn't really matter you don't see anything it's dark there's no blood and then trish is trying to escape through the main part of the house but crispin glover has been nailed to the door so she can't get through there (laughs) So is this where she jumps out the window? She ends, she jumps yeah, out the window then, at one point. She, she runs she, back she kind to her house. Of, yeah, she kind of gets chased in both houses. So I forget which window. I think it's this window. She jumps out the window. Really awesome stunt. Going through the window, kind of stumbling, falling back onto the ground, which I feel like there's a fake ground there because it moves way too much when the stunt actress hits the ground or maybe even stunt actor. I don't know. You can just shave a guy's legs and put on a wig. And, you know. <laughs> there's in Friday the 13th Part 7... In Elizabeth Caton's death scene, Elizabeth Caton has herself complained that it's like, oh, it's clearly a stunt man who they just shaved <laughs> legs and put a wig on. Although the filmmakers insist that the that the person who performed that stunt was a woman. So I don't know. Maybe she's just a big woman. I don't know. But anyways, then, yeah, she goes back to the house. They're locking the door and, and holding, you know, in so much as they can. They're doing everything they can. Also worth noting here that this house... This Jarvis house. I've seen this in multiple movies and television shows. I've seen this house in a lot. And and each time I see it, it's like, because it's the Friday the 13th house. Like, each time I see it, I'm like, oh, that's exciting. It's in, what's the movie about the George Kennedy Bigfoot alien movie? It's in that movie with Michelle Bauer. Uh... It's in an episode of Columbo from the 80s. And each time I see it, too, I'm looking for something very specific. Because there is a scene when Jason comes through the door, or I don't remember if it's the main door, but there's like some door, and he's swiping the machete, and he leaves a cut in the wood. And if you actually look really closely, you can see there's already a cut there from a previous take, I'm sure. And oh, so no there's way. like, I'm just picturing this house, just it's, it's like machete marks all over. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, so when it shows up in one of those 80s Columbo episodes, or maybe early 90s, like when Columbo came back and it was like, okay, I'm look, looking, are there machete marks? <laughs> I'm just like looking for that all, all the time. And I'm sure they got that part of the house resided or whatever. But yeah, so they board everything up, but Jason still, he comes through the window, he grabs Tommy and she ends up, stabbing him with like the back of a hammer like the claw end of a hammer but he does end up bursting through the door great shot he just kind of he just busts through kool-aid man style and (laughs) this is it actually it's it i don't think it's it's the machete swipe but he throws either a machete or maybe the hammer and it like hits the wall and leaves a mark And, and and if you look at the shot you can see there's a mark like right next to it from a previous shot so they end up getting chased upstairs you know, they hit him over the head with the TV or whatever, and, and they're able to free themselves to the point where, like, hey, Tommy, you can get out of here. Yeah. Oh, this is actually, then she <laughs> she ends up getting chased to the other house. This is actually when she do, goes through the window. So maybe she just squeezes by Crispin Glover's body earlier. This is when she get, jumps through the window. And, you know, Tommy, in theory, running for his life, in actuality is not. He is upstairs looking at the newspaper clippings of the old picture of boy Jason when he drowned, and he is cutting off his hair so that when (laughs) when trish and jason are back in this house she swipes at him with the machete well she first hits him like between the fingers like think of the world's deepest paper cut like between your fingers because that's what's going on here it's going like well into his hand it's nasty and then she also swipes towards his face and this knocks off his mask and, you know, so you, this is a tradition. You, we get the Jason face reveal towards the end of the movie, right? And each time it's a little different. It's nasty. It's a big old ugly 
orc-like creature, basically. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly how I would describe it, actually. <laughs> and then Tommy comes downstairs, head shaved, and he's going <laughs> to try... This is this is this film's version of the mom's sweater. He's going to try and distract Jason. He's like, hey, Jason, remember me? You know, th- like, this is, this is uh, going back to twins. It looks like I'm looking in a mirror. <laughs> and he kind of distracts Jason long enough for tommy to eventually smack him with the machete he like hits him in the side of the face there's an amazing shot of jason falling down landing the machete like handle landing on the ground so that the machete's up and then there's a just absolutely disgusting shot of his face sliding down the machete and you see like the eyes move it is an amazing amazing. effect and it's so nasty and again this is this is what they this is why they had all those other trims and cuts in the other scenes they wanted to keep as much of this as possible in theory because they wanted to convince you that yes jason is absolutely dead but maybe also because tom Savini was just really proud of this i don't know Oh, I mean, I would 100% be if I was him. <laughs> so Tommy continues whacking him over and over again with the machete, screaming, die. And Trish is screaming, Tommy, Tommy. And then that's pretty much it. We we then pick back up at a hospital. Trish is speaking to someone and they're asking, like, okay, what, what about Tommy? Like, what was up with that? And it's just like, oh, well, in moments of great stress, people are capable of incredible feats of strength. You know, the proverbial woman lifts up a car to save her baby or whatever i don't know if they literally yeah. cite that example but that's the one that they always give and these explanations for these kinds of things and then so she goes and sees tommy and they hug but then we get an eerie shot of tommy looking into the camera with kind of evil eyes and that is the end of the movie so it's a little bit of a halloween four ending a little bit i mean he does kill the villain it's different but also, the ending seeming to imply perhaps Tommy is going to be the next Jason or, or do something, you know. But obviously, you know how the, these fucking series work. They don't. They never pick up on that stuff. <laughs> yeah, but they never pick up on that. They, two movies in a row, it's hinted that Tommy's going to be evil. Because the next movie, too, he's, he's in three movies. He's the only character in the series, I, I think, to be in three yeah, they they do the same kind of ending <laughs> to the fifth one. And, and then the sixth one, he's just like a normal, like, good guy. And it's like, oh, okay. So it took him a while to abandon it. But eventually, yes, it is abandoned. And Jim, that is the end of Friday the 13th, the final chapter. What did you think of this film? Patrick, I think this is my favorite Friday the 13th movie. I think this might actually be, other than, like, Jason X and then, like, Freddy vs. Oh, Jason, if you if you count that. The first four, and those two that I just mentioned, are probably the only Friday the 13th movies I've actually seen. Oh, and, and then the okay. reboot. But I think this one's my favorite. You do have classic Jason. It's certainly the best of that group, then, that you've seen. I, I do yeah. think the sixth one compares pretty favorably. Completely different movie, but it, it most, most fans seem to think it's between the fourth and the sixth. Yeah, I like it a lot. Oh, the effects are great. I like the characters. The teens seem somehow more... Um, palatable on screen i agree than the other movies i agree we get a little bit of characterization we get a lot quite frankly for jimbo Mm -hmm. but even the others at least a little bit like sarah it ultimately doesn't lead to anything satisfying but for a movie like this she's given a lot of character development i even feel like the acting by all the teens is just better than most of the teens in the other movies i think that's probably true I mean, Lawrence Monison playing Teddy. This is no last American version, but he's good. <laughs> he's annoying, but that's what the character's supposed to be. Yeah, and then classic Jason, hockey mask. As you mentioned earlier, this is the first movie where he's wearing the hockey mask from the beginning. This is the best Jason we've had yet. So Jason's still a person. He's a zombie from six on. And in, in those movies, he's truly like... He's the Terminator. He's indestructible. He's going through walls. This is the most indestructible he's felt so far. And there is a dumb sense of satisfaction you get seeing Jason go through a door or go through a window. And he's gone through those things before. But this movie here, it just feels better. I don't know how to yeah. describe it. Maybe it's just like the budget is up and they're just filming it in a different way or the or the props are more realistic or something. Well, that house, that classic house featured in... Demon Warp, I couldn't think of the name of the movie earlier. Demon Warp and Columbo and at least one or two other things I've seen. I think maybe a Tales from the Crypt episode. Yeah, well, I've seen, while I've seen the were, Jarvis house in so many things. While you were talking about that, I was looking up The Great Outdoors with uh, John Candy and um, 
It's not that, is exactly. it? Exactly. No, it isn't. No. Okay. Yeah, I was going. <laughs> no, I was going to think. I, like, I, I mean, I haven't. I was like, it's it somehow seems familiar, but I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Yeah, I'm. I'm gonna look up if that location has a uh, IMDb, like where I can see what other things have been filmed there, because I am curious if if it, if it shows like an address and and you can just click on what other movies have been filmed there. Anyways, I, I just really like this movie. I I like okay, all the characters. Okay, hang on, Kelly Gulch. 1801 North Topanga Canyon Boulevard, featured in Eraser, Friday the 13th, the final chapter, Pumpkinhead, that's right, I saw Pumpkinhead this past Halloween on TV and I recognized it, My Girl 2, never heard of it, Friday the 13th, The New Blood, that's true, they they disguise it fairly well, so Friday the 13th, The, the New Blood, that's the seventh movie, it's the exact same setup, two houses next to each other, one of like a family and one of teens partying. But they I think they did reshoots in the house from the fourth one. So you don't really you can't really tell, but it, it's yeah, it's featured in the movie Parents, Murphy's Law, Charles Bronson. That's I re- I recognized it from that one too. Yeah. Ed Gein, the movie Tomboy starring Betsy Russell, aka Mrs. Jigsaw. Okay. <laughs> okay. A Bird in the Hand looks like it's a Oh, that's that's the Colombo episode, I think. Yeah, is that's the Colombo episode of Bird in the Hand, Demon Warp, The Companion, Exodus Fall. It looks like nothing I recognize from beyond this, but uh, an eighties Twilight Zone episode, Parks and Rec. Oh, really? was recently in, in Parks and Rec. <laughs> this is us. Yeah. So it's, this is this house for just being a random house that I assume is just owned by a family has been featured in a lot of stuff and a lot of stuff I've seen. Demon Warp, Columbo. I don't think I've seen Tomboy. I've seen some Betsy Russell sex comedies. I don't think I've seen that one. Murphy's Law, that's three. Pumpkinhead makes four. And then the two Friday the 13th movies. I've seen this. That is insane. I don't know. <laughs> I've seen the White House in seven movies. Yeah. Do you think this is one of the most <laughs> photographed or, I mean, um, filmed houses? Again, as far, as far as what I assume is just a private residence, it has to be up there. And it's in the middle of nowhere, right? It's not like this is... In one of those houses in Beverly Hills, like the Elm Street house or something, which I've seen in person now. And, uh, you know, it's it's diff- It's a different kind of thing. It's not, in theory, in the location where you'd constantly be filming. But again, if huh. it's near L.A. and it's in the woods, you need to shoot stuff in the woods. You so maybe it's... <laughs> Friday the 13th, the final chapter, is absolutely one of the best Friday the 13th movies. I'm like most people. I would... You know, it's four and six, kind of hand in hand, and it, it maybe it might depend on my mood too, because those movies are tonally so different. But it's a fantastic movie, and I, I will say, I not that it's one of the best movies ever that I would call a slasher movie. I don't think it's as good as the original Nightmare on Elm Street, or as good as Halloween, or Texas Chainsaw Massacre, or whatever. I do think it's one of the best slasher movies ever, maybe even the best, and in the sense that. I like viewing the the slasher genre as a genre primarily about sleaze and bad taste and shock and violence and usually not a whole lot more than that. And again, I think those other movies that I pointed out tend to have something a bit more. But when I think of just the preeminent slasher films, not so much as films, but as slasher movies, I think of movies like Pieces, you know, that's like a weirdo foreign movie. So there's like weird elements to it and nobody knows what they're doing or saying so um but i think of the prowler of course which we've mentioned a couple times because it's joseph zito and tom savini and i'm sure it's the reason why joseph joseph zito got the job to direct this movie but yeah i think it's like the prowler and it's friday the 13th the final chapter there's probably a couple other movies that i would put up there like i said pieces but that's a bit of a i don't know that's just a personal pick i just love pieces that much but Absolutely. There is there is no more depth to this movie than there needs to be. There's enough character stuff kind of keeping it interesting. But then at the end of the day, it's about the killing. It's about the violence. It's about the indestructible Jason Voorhees. And it's about the gratuitous nudity. And this film pulls all of that stuff out really well. So absolutely one of the best slasher films, one of the most slasher E films, if you will. <laughs> Just like a perfect, perfect combination. We are not trying to do anything more than entertain people. We are Mm -hmm. trying to give you violence, give you gratuitous nudity, give you an indestructible, fun killer. And at the end of the day, I mean, this movie, it has characters who are just going out and trying to have a good time. And that's really what I feel like this, this movie is for me as a viewer. I feel like Teddy when he's watching those weird ass stag porno (laughs) films 
all worries of the outside world have left my mind. It's just me and Jason when I watch this movie, and that's really oh, that's, that's, cute. Really, that's really that's really what I want, <laughs> what I want out of a Friday the Thirteenth movie. Nothing else matters. It's just me, Jason, and Corey Feldman. <laughs> Well, let's get to a movie that's super disgusting, and I resent you a little bit for making me watch another Saw movie, but I remember the last time we covered a Saw movie together, you said, wait till the fourth one. So I've never seen this one. Now, I don't know why I would have told you told you to like wait for the fourth one other than... The opening scene. Well, the opening scene, but I was going to say, like, maybe if you had said you had only seen the first three before, and I'm like, yeah, just wait for the fourth one when we get to it or something. Well, I think we were talking about how how uncomfortable the body horror, okay. I guess, okay. makes me. And you're like, oh, wait till the fourth one. Yeah, well, the fourth <laughs> one opens with the autopsy. Well, it, and... it, it opens on an opening scene. <laughs> yes, yeah, we're opening up Jigsaw's body because Jigsaw does die in Saw 3 and we stick to that. And it's amazing how long the series has stuck to that. Yeah, we keep giving Tobin Bell screen time, but we've never, like, done a sequel where he comes back from the dead or something. And it's almost to the point where, like, the Saw movies are so ridiculous, I wouldn't put that past them. And speaking of, I mentioned, obviously, there's a curse on any horror series, apparently, that has a sequel called The Final Chapter, because that will not be The Final Chapter, (laughs) i.e. Friday the 13th, The Final Chapter. We have several Friday the 13ths after that. We have Puppet Master 5, the final chapter, several Puppet Masters after that. Then we have Saw, the final chapter, a.k.a. I think that's the same one that was also released as Saw 3D. That We've had more Saw movies since then, but they haven't made a direct sequel to that. So I give the Saw series some credit to a certain extent by actually sticking to that final chapter part. Mm-hmm. But... I mean, it, it's kind of having your cake and eating it too, like right, like that's in in essence one of the big problems with, with the Saw series. We want to give Tobin Bell as much as we can to have him do, but shit, we killed him. Like we really have to kind of <laughs> challenge ourselves as writers to come up with ways to get him involved. And some movies in the series do it better than others. I.e., Saw X, the most recent one, the best film in the series, if you ask me. I mean, it's I, I still like that first one, and the, really the first two, but Saw X is just an excellent movie. A critically acclaimed Saw movie. Did you ever think you would live long enough to, for there to be a critically acclaimed <laughs> no. Saw movie? I did not. Because <laughs> no. even no, if the first one wasn't critically acclaimed, like, wh- when's it going to happen? It happened. 2023. Compared to the first movie, the first Saw movie, let's say, which felt more like a, um, what was that movie with Brad Pitt? Seven. Seven, yeah. Yeah, they, they were going for that, yeah. Yeah, it, it had a very kind of Seven vibe. There's a, there's a scene in this, I wouldn't say the movie overall reminds me of Seven, speaking of Saw 4 now. There is a scene here that reminds me very much of a scene in Seven, and I haven't seen Seven in forever. I've seen all the Saw movies a couple times, so. Oh, you know, are, are, you about 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 the, are you talking about the, the hotel? Yeah, the pervert uh, guy. Uh, yeah. That, that feels I, like, a, isn't there a scene where, I think, now Seven, I think, shoots around the violence more so than the saw movies do obviously because they're going for a different vibe but there's a scene where they're interviewing someone who had to like rape someone with like a knife dildo or something and they're like interrogating him afterwards or talking to him afterwards and and it it felt a little like what we see in the hotel here but just with more implication and less stupidity well and also this movie at this point in the series i guess they're not really going for like interesting storyline they're going strictly for shock factor. They're they're going for shock factor, and they're going for... They're still trying to recreate the magic of the twist of the first Saw. The first Saw is, yes. oh my god, the killer was there the whole time. The person that we thought was the killer wasn't the killer. Mm-hmm. Very similar ending here. So they're going for shock, primarily. Shock and creativity in the kills. One, th- one thing I don't think we've said in any of the other Saw movies that we've done, I don't know if this was true of the first one. This is true of, like, the Darren Lynn Bowsman Saw movies, which this is a Darren Lynn Bowsman-directed movie, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so Darren Lynn Bowsman and maybe just the filmmakers in general were very passionate about these Saw traps have to actually work. So not that they're literally removing limbs, but they wanted the saw traps to be like authentic and actually like engineered, which is really interesting and probably more work than you might expect to go into a movie like this. But I just wanted to point that out because that's been true at least for a few movies and I don't think we've ever said it. So that is impressive. And it is impressive because it also, I mean, when you're looking at like these traps move or or thinking about how they would actually operate, I mean, it does lend an air of like credibility authenticity yeah no it does it does 
Though I will say in this movie, they use a similar trap twice. And it's it's the trap with the chain that goes through the center. And then also the trap where the woman's hair is tied to the... Oh, so thing. we're talking about the very first trap. The, uh, the blind guy versus the deaf guy or whatever. The blind guy versus the mute guy, excuse me. Yeah, and both traps and then, have similar and then the mechanics. You yeah. know, like it's just it's just like a twisting pull. Well, this is the thing, though. I mean, but it's used in two very different ways, of course. Even even though we know more than one person is in on the jigsaw thing, I guess at this point we don't necessarily know that because yes, Jigsaw's dead, but so is Amanda. So you know, for all we know, this is all Jigsaw. This stuff. But even though there's other people like who are like apprentices to Jigsaw, whatever you want to call them, accomplices, whatever, you still kind of get the impression that they're all, that the traps are all engineered and designed by Jigsaw. That that he is the one with the vision and others are kind of just doing his bidding. So he, maybe he's going to cut some corners and, and repeat a trap or, or something here yeah. and there. You yeah. know, he's, and like, and, he's only uh, got so many day, hours in a day. It. Yeah. yeah. Maybe it's even this movie. I don't remember... At some point in his bench, he's like an engineer of some kind, but that's like the only stuff we get about like why he'd be able to design all this stuff. The only thing that confuses me really about this movie is the timeline, because this is a movie that takes place directly after the events of the third movie, but then at but the end of the movie, also before. It's, yeah. Well, that's that's the twist. That is yeah. the twist. Uh, the, the twist here, there's two twists, or the, the twist is twofold. One, <laughs> oh my god, this guy in the trap was the jigsaw. The entire time. Yes. A, a new apprentice that we haven't... Correction, we have met him before, but we've never met him as an apprentice. He's mm-hmm. just He just had a couple lines in Saw 3. Didn't really... I don't know if we even talked about him at all. The other twist is that, oh, actually everything we're seeing happened before the end of Saw 3. So technically Jigsaw is alive during all of this. We just don't see him, except for in flashbacks. Yeah, and so at the end of Saw 3, right, that's when Jeff is killed, right? Like, well, Jeff isn't killed happen? in Saw 3. We see him die here now. That's right, yeah. Yeah, so Jeff, just a reminder, Jeff is the pain-in-the-ass character who is mourning the death of his uh, son. I think son, but he has a daughter, and he's kind of been neglectful to the daughter. So Jigsaw captures the daughter, holds her hostage, and he has to go through all these challenges. Meanwhile, his wife is doing brain surgery on Jigsaw. Yeah, so Jeff's annoying and, and a pain in the ass there. He is the hero. He's the one that kills Jigsaw. But by killing Jigsaw, he unwittingly also kills his wife because his wife's uh, shotgun collar is tied to Jigsaw's heart rate. Yes. Yeah. But so, we, but we don't see the end of Jeff in Saw 3. He just kind of gets locked in there or whatever. Yeah, I thought we did. I, I thought at the very end... There's like an no. unknown character that rushes in and kills him, but okay. I don't believe so. Okay, well, enough of bullshit twists and, and talking about the movie without talking about the movie. You think it's over just because I'm dead? It's not over. Hello, Officer Rick. You have witnessed your colleagues disappear. Tonight, I give you the opportunity to save everyone. Welcome to your rebirth. Super disgusting opening. We begin by witnessing an autopsy being performed on Jigsaw, on Tobin Bell. And it's super disgusting. In this movie, purely for the shock factor of it being totally disgusting. They're cutting open his, his head and removing his brain and and thumping his chest open. like it's Well, yeah, they go through disgusting. his stomach, too, because he swallows the tape. He yes. covered it in wax and saw through. And this is another thing where... At this point in the series, I'm sorry, Jigsaw's omniscient. He has to be. Yeah. Because he knew he was going to die. That's why he ate the tape. Uh, because I don't know how he's going to shit that out, you know, if he doesn't die. So they cut it through the stomach. But the the tape, as most of his tapes do, says, play me. But uh, <laughs> as, as for the actual autopsy, too, I think I said this was Saw 3, and I may have been mixing up Saw 3 and 4. But obviously all these Saw movies are super graphic and gory. And like the Friday the 13th movies, or many of them, they had their brushes with the MPAA, now known as the MPA, of course. I know they were, I think I said this was Saw 3, but they're like, hey, this is too much. You, you gotta ease off on the, the brain surgery. And they're like, well, no, this is actually like super realistic. Like, we're not budging on this. This isn't 
gratuitous this is what it's like this is what it would be like (laughs) if you had to drill into a guy's brain while he's without anesthesia or whatever same kind of thing with the autopsy here i think and i don't remember which of the two movies where they said that that they basically got away with it by saying no we're we're like consulting medical textbooks like this is what this looks like (sighs) great yeah they might have said it with include it (laughs) it doesn't but i mean you you have to find the tape yeah (laughs) Just you so have squeamish. to find the, the you have to find the tape. Actually, technically, you don't because this is all at the end of Saw Four. So technically, you don't have to find the end of the tape. But it, but it does. Yeah. So so with the tape, they bring in Hoffman, who is a minor minor character in Saw Three. He's a cop, and they have him listen to it because the tape is addre- addressed to Hoffman. Yeah, and I and think so the, what tape does the tape says, say, uh, "You think you've escaped, detective? Just because I'm dead, you think the game is over, but the game has just begun." Super ominous, and and this is this is too when you're going into Saw Four, and I'm thinking of when these movies are released. Mm-hmm. Jigsaw's dad, how the fuck are they making a sequel? <laughs> this is an exciting way to start it off. Like, oh, we're still doing the same Jigsaw stuff, even though he's dead, and you know, in theory, we're going to find out how this all works, and we kind of do, I guess. It, it becomes a little more confusing with some of the other movies, but yeah, we kind of hard cut from that directly to a game scene. I guess what I'm going to call a game scene. A trap. Trap scene. I'm going, go. I'm going to say trap in the sense that I think the terminology here is game is like the repeated stuff that someone has to go through, i.e. Jeff went through a game. Mm-hmm. Jeff went through went from trap to trap. He wasn't in the traps. He's in the game. You're right. The you're person right. here in the game is Rig. the who also has been in a number of movies. I don't know if he's introduced in the first one. He's at least in the—I know he's in Saw 2. And again— somewhat of a minor character in the previous films and this is something that the saw series repeatedly does is it takes a minor character and then all of a sudden in the next movie he's like a a main character and that's kind of interesting and it makes it feel like it's more thought out than i'm sure it was (laughs) yeah right because they're making this up as they go along they have to be because if it was planned it wouldn't have been this sloppy but it does kind of like when you're watching it it's like okay this is nice Well, anyways, this trap scene, there's two guys, there's like a device in the middle with a chain running through it, and an equal distance on each side of this machine, there's a man chained connected to this chain. We got Pedro Pascal with his mouth sewn shut. It's not literally Pedro Pascal. No. (laughs) There's a a similar face, I think, at least. Yeah. And then the other guy with his eyes sewn shut. So one guy can't see, the other can't talk. So the guy that can't see hears the other grunting and thinks that's the guy that's trying to kill him and starts throwing shit at him kind of blind, well, literally blindly. And the guy that can't speak is really just kind of fending for his life. He He can't say anything. He can't say, no, 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 we're in this together. Yeah, and the trap accidentally gets activated, and it starts pulling the chain in. So if the mute guy doesn't kill the blind guy and take the key off of the back of his neck to unhook himself, they're both just going to get crushed in this machine. Huge advantage, mute guy. I'll oh, just yeah. say it. Huge advantage. Huge, huge advantage. I mean, he obviously ends up winning it, but like obviously he has the advantage here. Not being able to talk is not as important here as 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 not being able to see (laughs) not seeing what's in front of you and not being able to know where i'm throwing these sharp objects or whatever yeah so mute guy does manage to kill blind guy and he does unlock his chain saving himself and then he starts to scream and he just rips all the stitches out of his lips which is disgusting Mm -hmm. sure then we just cut again but i guess we're reintroduced to officer rig and he's in the hunt for detective carrie and Donnie Wahlberg, right? Yeah. So, so again, this we have to remind people, and maybe I have to remind you too, because these movies are, you know, Detective Carrie had been there since the original. She is a minor, again, minor character in the first one. A little bit, her roles beefed up a little bit in Saw Two, and it looks like for a while that she's going to be the main character in Saw Three. But she is Dina Meyer. It ended up being cut from the film, but I think she's like. Donnie Wahlberg's ex-girlfriend or maybe ex-wife or something. They had like a past. Yeah, I, I and, think it's ex-wife, right? Well, I think it got cut. It oh. doesn't really matter. But but they were like, it's it's almost with what we have in the movies, it's almost like, oh, they were just partners or something. Because she's like, no, 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 in, in Saw 3 when she's alive, because Donnie Wahlberg's the main character in Saw 2. She's like, okay, we need to find, you know, Jigsaw's never kept anyone this long. We need to find him. He's obviously still alive. We need to find Donnie Wahlberg. 
and so but then she ends up dying she gets killed in that like Chest. angel trap yeah. thing that rips open her ribs and she gets killed by amanda amanda because amanda's traps were not designed to have you win yeah so like they say like oh the key didn't unlock it like this wasn't fair this isn't jigsaw's thing so that's you know it's, it's a man and then it's revealed at the end of Oh, fuck. No, maybe it's revealed in the early, because at the end of Saw 2, is, uh, the twist is Amanda was helping him. So maybe we, we know from the beginning that it's Amanda. I can't remember exactly. But now they're looking at the crime scene and saying, it couldn't have just been Amanda. She's not strong enough. And Jigsaw was dying. There has to be another person. Well, okay, well, first off, let's backtrack here because this becomes important later on. We have... I'm um, trying to help you. I'm no, trying no, to help I, you get, I, get this moving. Listen, I, I, I appreciate your help. Thank you. Well, you have Hoffman and you have Rig. And Hoffman says, look, don't bust through that door. It hasn't been cleared yet. Oh, God, yet. this is so sloppy. Yeah, and Rig busts through the door. And then that's when they find... You know never to go through an unsecured door. Yeah, exactly. That's like the moral lesson of soft for some <laughs> fucking reason. It is, I know. Yeah. It's like the, the moral lesson is you can't save everybody. <laughs> yeah. So so that's so, it. so so again, if we follow Jigsaw's philosophy, right? If you fuck up, I'm going to teach you. You know, you're not appreciating life enough. He's basically being punished because he appreciates life too much. It's completely inconsistent, and, and again, he appreciates I'm, other people's lives. I accept a little bit of inconsistency with the Jigsaw philosophy because he's hypocritical, and I think that makes him kind of interesting. But this is one step too far, at least. This this is too bu- too too much bullshit. This is like <laughs> you think you can save everybody. This game is going to teach you that that's not true. It's like <laughs> what? It's such bullshit. What it the really fuck? Is. <laughs> what kind of bullshit is this yeah well just everything is kind of sloppy about this so rig busts in that's when they find the body of carrie and he's upset and the fbi agents show up we have peter strom and Lindsay perez yeah and peter peter strom is he's like a i I don't want to say big actor but that's scott patterson he was like on a major show gilmore girls he's from gilmore (laughs) girls which i i think there's there's (laughs) You know the, the the Venn diagram of 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 uh, Saw fans and Gilmore Girls fans. There's five people out there, but they must love this guy. <laughs> yeah, well, this guy Strom, but he immediately says, like, he looks at the body of Detective Carey and he goes, "Hmm, Amanda couldn't have lifted this body or her her alive up there, even knocked out, and Jigsaw couldn't have done it because he was riddled with cancer. So they ha- there has to be another accomplice." Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, this is all of the stuff that I've said so far, but go yeah, on. Okay. Well, anyways, back to Rig. He's super obsessed with, with Jigsaw and this ongoing case. And there's a bit where he his wife wants him to just take some time off and go visit her mother. And he's like, I can't. I have to save everybody. And th- <laughs> this is where this is where the game begins for him, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, well... <laughs> <laughs> no, that this does, I mean, it doesn't go anywhere, but it does actually bring up something interesting. What the fuck is the life of a cop like in this Saw universe? Be Holy terrible. shit, you are on edge your entire life. And that's actually kind of depicted with Donnie Wahlberg. I mean, he's just a, an asshole to begin with in, that, in Saw 2. But like, yeah, these, listen, I'm not, I think generally in, in real life, cops are generally assholes, but like, in the Saw universe, I'm I'm all prepared to accept any kind of bullshit police brutality thing because, like, oh my god, these people <laughs> have the most miserable job in the world. The most miserable and existence. <laughs> and, and one thing worth noting, too, they never say where these movies take place. It's just like a, it's just like wherever. And most of them are shot in Toronto, but, like, I don't know. It's just like a generic city. We know it's a city. Also, something that's not really made clear, uh, at some point, Hoffman is kidnapped, and he's he's added to he's this. He's in the same trap with Donnie Wahlberg. Because yes. we see finally that Donnie Wahlberg's alive. I mean, we kind of we saw a flashback to him kind of surviving the bathroom, but we really don't know what has been going because he's been held for what six months or something. Yeah, something, they have yeah, some something kind of line, like that. Like, and we see this when Rig wakes up after he's knocked out by an intruder in his house. He wakes up and he goes to his bedroom and there's like a video playing with Donnie Wahlberg and Hoffman in this track. Donnie Wahlberg in full beard because that's that's what you do. You grow a beard if you're in captivity. You don't know this. <laughs> yeah. Even though he's around blades constantly in his life, now, I'm sure. <laughs> know, yeah. He needs the can shaving bring, cream, though. Can you bring problem. that knife a little close to my chin, please? Yeah, homeless man beard. <laughs> 
Well, Rig has 90 minutes to save Donnie and Hoffman, but he has to go through this game that Jigsaw has laid out for him, right? Mm-hmm. And it's different than in Saw 3. It's uh, This is actually this is more realistic than Saw 3 in the sense that Saw 3, it's all just in some facility somewhere. And that's always been a little bit like, come on, there can't be that many warehouses in this fucking <laughs> city that we, that we couldn't find all this stuff, right? Yeah. But this this one is it's not it's not all in a controlled environment. He kind of has to go everywhere around the city and just do shit, and that's more believable. I'm not I'm not even saying saying it's better, but it's just, it's more believable than Saw Three, I guess. Yeah, well, like like even the scary thing about this one is that the first test that he has to do is in his own living room, and he walks into his living room, and there's this prostitute who is locked in this device, and when it starts, it's gonna it's gonna pull her hair gonna scalp her alive exactly yeah. and rig is told by jigsaw via a tape that he's not supposed to save this woman that somebody else will save mm-hmm. her but he disregards jigsaw's message anyways and he tries to save her yeah which he does and then he ev- he eventually does he has to shoot through her ponytail i think he can't find the key or whatever whatever, whatever he needs to find to unlock it so he shoots through her the ponytail done. then she grabs a knife and tries to kill him and she en- and he ends up killing her i guess but her thing is she had a tape that was telling her the man who will save you is actually going to throw you in prison yeah, because yeah. we've been, we've given him these photographs proving that you're a prostitute and it's like would he though no <laughs> would he no he wouldn't he, she's not going to prison for the come on this is bullshit i'm sorry just <laughs> random evidence submitted by jigsaw random photographs this, i don't think that's admissible in court and even if it were this dude's got better fucking things to do than throw her in prison i understand and even her in her point of view i don't think even if she understood i'm going to prison if this guy saves me i don't think she would want to kill him no i'd take my chance i'd be like you know what you just yeah, I, I'd rather not throw me in prison. Alive, I, I, Jigs, Jigsaw's not going to find me if I'm in prison, right? I'd be, <laughs> yeah, I, I'd rather be alive than have to go through this bullshit again. Well, you know? exactly. I, I, this is a little, little, little too much for me to. Accept. Well, and and this is one of those things that where Jigsaw's trying to teach Rig a lesson. Right, that yeah, you can't it, save everybody. Don't, don't save everyone because those people you save might try to kill you. Well, and on top of that, I he's, guess, he's, is he's, this you've got 90 lesson? minutes and you've already been fucking yeah. around for 10 minutes with this with this hooker. That's yeah. the more important thing, I think, right? And and I guess it's implied. I don't think it's we ever find out. But like he said, she'd be saved. I guess someone is just going to come in when he leaves. Yeah, I guess we don't so. know who or somebody or else is doing their exactly. own game. I don't know. Or or the or the timer just re, you know stops and and reattaches her uh, to pay on like <laughs> if once he leaves the apartment. I don't know, but yeah, a little too many moving pieces for me to really believe this scene. Well, on his way out of the house, though, there's a box with two keys, right? And I think there's a note that says one key will take a life and one key will save a life. Right. And one of the keys is a hotel room key. So he heads to this disgusting CD hotel, which I think they actually call it a motel, but I'm going to call it a hotel because that's what it looks like. Like the like the, you picture going up to the desk and it's like, hey, I want a room. And they're like, OK, it's going to be five bucks extra if you want sheets. You know? <laughs> it's like uh, this seems like a charge by the hour type place. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. And this disgusting place, there's there's like hobos living in the entranceway. But anyways, Rick gets up there. He goes up to this room and he gets another message from Jigsaw. And, you know, it's saying that he has to lure the hotel manager upstairs mm-hmm. and put him in a trap. So which means he's got to get a crane. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. this guy's very this guy's huge. heavy set. And this guy's really disgusting. He reminds me of the, uh, the glutton in Seven. That's, who we're That's what I'm saying. This 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 is the scene that reminds me of Seven because yeah. he's like a pervert. He gets he gets punished for lust here, basically. But this is actually as disgusting as this stuff is. I like some of this scene because again, you're not supposed to save everyone. Mm-hmm. First one, oh, she's a prostitute. Who, who gives a fuck? I'll save her. This guy, <laughs> it's like genuinely. Yeah, I don't really want to save this guy. He's he's got like photos of like underage girls and maybe even boys too and it's like ooh, this guy's a fucking creep this guy this guy deserves to die as as much as anyone who's ever been in a saw trap exactly and you kind of see that so rig gets this manager to open up this this other room and in the room hanging from the ceiling are all these photographs of like people that he's raped photos that this guy's kept 
and then the television or, comes on. Or maybe to- not that he's kept, but these are just photos that Jigsaw took. Oh, yeah. You know? and, okay. this, and this is the other thing, too. It's like, we don't know how Jigsaw gets his intel. How does he know that? Yeah. He even has a video that's set up to play of of one of these rapes that this guy committed. Yeah, so so Rig forces him into this trap, and there's like stuff that Jigsaw's written on the wall, like, see what I see, and stuff like that. And this is when you do see Rig kind of go, look, this guy does deserve to die. Yeah, there's a lot of, like, when the guy's pleading, there's a lot of, shut up, you fucking freak kind of stuff. This trap is kind of gruesome. He has to kind lay of. on a bed. and Kind his- of. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and put his head in a vice, and all four of his limbs are connected to, like, a different restraint, and he's given these two buttons, and Riggs, like, well, have at it, and he steps out of the room, and the catch is the guy either blinds himself, or he lets himself die, and he has 60 seconds to do it. Yeah, and again, the the symbolism here of Jigsaw, it's like, you have to remove your eyes, which have led you astray. Yeah, which I kind of um, like. For, that. That's cool. Yeah, I, I do too. But I, what I don't like is how the guy goes one at a time. Oh, I know. What an idiot. It's it's <laughs> like, if you're going to do it, do them both. Like, it's, I'm not going to do it, see if I like it, and then go for the second one. I know. You know? Like these big rusty like pickaxes. And, and, and here's, here's the thing. It's perfectly reasonable if this guy just doesn't do it. But he does do one, and then he just doesn't have enough time to do the second one. Yeah, and then his body gets ripped apart and limbs are hitting the yeah. wall. <laughs> which is pretty yeah. cool. But gross. When the FBI does show up, they point out that a missing guy who's a lawyer named Art Blank, yeah. he's been missing for a couple of weeks, he, th- the room had been constantly yes. like rented out under his name, and they're figuring that's how all the machinery and equipment for the trap was brought into the room. To depart from this, because this is all happening simultaneously. simultaneously. I, again, again, for the most part, the formula of the Saw movies is we have a cop plot and the investigative plot and whoever's in the main game, right? Mm-hmm. This is going back to the first one. Here, the investigative plot, it's, it's mostly done by the Gilmore Girls guy, Strom, yeah. and he's doing a lot of interrogating of Jigsaw's ex-wife, played by Betsy Russell, and this is Jill Tuck. Mm-hmm. She, we did see her in Saw 3, however briefly. When Jigsaw was, like, almost dying from the surgery, he had, like, visions of oh, a that's right. be- beautiful blonde woman standing by, like, a tree in a park. And he even said, like, I love you or something. And remember, that's, that's what pissed off Amanda, because it looked like he was saying that to the woman doing surgery on him, Jeff's wife. Yeah, yeah. So... <laughs> I want to bring that up because, like, that was one of the few carrots we had at the end of Saw 3 of, like, if you're going to make a sequel to that movie, what do you do? It's like, okay, obviously we have to kind of find out who that woman is. But we, how does it, it just kind of, they're just kind of interrogating her. It's, she just kind of shows up in the movie. It's not, like, there's no, like, investigation to, like, oh my god, he was married. It's just, like, yeah, it, first meet her, she's just being interrogated. And, I mean, it, it makes sense in the sense that at this point with Jigsaw dead, they know who John Kramer is. So they're not like still finding, they're not like following Jigsaw clues so much. They're like at a dead end. They just know people are kidnapped and stuff. And again, going back to one of the twists, I guess this is going going on like during Saw 3. So I guess they were on to a little bit more about John Kramer. In, well, actually, no, hang on. The twist is John Kramer isn't dead throughout most of this movie, so why are they interrogating her, I guess? Well, no, they they know it's John Kramer, I guess, from Saw 2 on. Yeah. Because they actually talk. So, okay, so they know it's John Kramer. He's just, like, in hiding in a warehouse somewhere. Okay, so I guess that makes sense. This is what happens with some of the Saw movies, because all these twists and stuff, you have to sound things out before they make sense to you. <laughs> I know, because I know. if you really think about that them. Issue so, with this movie. Well, see, and I, I was actually going to bring up the wife, because she, there's really no impact on the story, because like you said... Not much of one, no. ...interrogating her up until they kind of start putting clues together. Well, there's a little bit, she she reveals a little bit, and I don't, I don't know how much of this is the interrogation or how much of this is just flashbacks, because we see a lot of flashbacks of her and Jigsaw, but she has, like, a clinic for, like, drug addicts. Yeah, it's like a methadone clinic or something. Yeah, but I don't remember the name of the clinic, but the slogan is Cherish Your Life, and that's what Jigsaw has written on the wall in this movie, so they're like, okay, what is that? what connection does that have like your slogan is jigsaw slogan she's just like that's not his thing and it's like i don't know if i'd say that if if it's written on the wall in blood or whatever yeah. you know, i'd probably try, i'd probably try and distance myself from that but <laughs> yeah so in some of the flashbacks again we see tobin bell john kramer with her she's pregnant 
and then she lets in or there there's a like late at night when she's closing up a guy comes over and says hey i left my coat or whatever in here yeah can you get it for me so she unlocks it lets him in but then he just steals drugs and on the way out slams the door against her which causes her to have a miscarriage well then there's also like they were going to name well, hang their on. son let's, Gideon. Let's, 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 yes, okay, yeah. So they're going to name the son Gideon, which is significant because I think one of the warehouses that Jigsaw has is like the Gideon storehouse yeah, or something. Yeah, he's bought like a warehouse and it's and it's like a, it used to be like a meat factory, the Gideon Meat Factory or something. Yeah, that's what it is. Gideon Meat Packing or something. So yeah. there's, yeah, so just focusing a little bit more here. The death of the baby one of the motivations for Jigsaw to do what he does, which is odd because I thought his motivation was already he's dying and he has cancer. Like, we keep giving him more motivation. Like, why is he doing this? Oh, he tried killing himself. It didn't work. And then he realizes, I appreciate my life, and it's a shame that other people don't. I have cancer, and I'm dying, but I still appreciate my life. It's a shame that other people don't. My baby died, and now I'm mad at the guy that did that. And then I'm going to put him in a trap and do this experimental therapy to to see if it works really rehabilitate him it doesn't work and he ends up kind of killing himself when he tries to attack jigsaw he like falls into a bunch of barbed yeah, wire he, he or whatever just, like, he, he just sidesteps the crazy guy and the crazy guy just falls into a bucket of barbed wire i do like how that first jigsaw trap is like shoddily made and it just kind of falls apart that that feels very again he has to like perfect what he's working on right yes yeah so he's got like three or four different motivations now. And at this point, too, it's like the character's dead. The motivation isn't that interesting anymore. It's just like we accept that this happens. Let's just kind of get on with it. Let's see what more mysteries there are to the present. The past isn't that. But again, we're trying to how do we get Tobin Bell involved? Oh, exactly. Right. And I mean, so es- especially after Saw 2 and 3, where Tobin Bell was a big part of them. Well, yeah. And I mean, these flashbacks with Tobin Bell take up a I'm not going to say like a large chunk of the movie, but large enough that it kind of... A decent amount, you know, an appropriate amount. And also, so going back to Jill, Jill's being interrogated. She insists, yeah, that's Jigsaw's thing. I didn't, you know, we divorced. I didn't know anything about this. They kind of just let that go. Like, they don't push back on it too much. I mean, obviously, they're interrogating her. But meanwhile, we've already established there's another accomplice. Yeah. Like, who better than her? Now, it turns out she's not the accomplice that we're talking about in this film. I don't know. It's 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 sloppy. It's it's sloppy, and some of it's acceptable because again, they're kind of. It almost feels like they're they're figuring out the story as they as they're going along. That's which exactly I what think it feels kinda like. It's kind of fun, but yeah, it's not it's not the cleanest story in the world. Well, okay, l- let's get back to Officer Rig or whatever he is, Detective Officer. So all that stuff's going on with Jill in the background. Rig is still doing his game, and after he leaves the hotel, he has to go to this, quote-unquote, the place where it all began. And he goes to this school where, I guess at some point years ago, this little girl was being beaten by her father. Yeah. And the father got off scot-free, and as the father patted the officer's back, Rig just turned around and clocks him in the face and kind of hits mm-hmm. him a couple times. And the lawyer, it's revealed, the well, guy's exactly. lawyer, is Art Blank, a.k.a. Pedro Pascal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which, I mean, I might as well say it now before I forget. It's also revealed that he was Jill's lawyer and helped Jigsaw yeah. buy this meat packing plant. Again, so all the clues are pointing towards Jill being heavily involved in this. Yes. But also to Art Blank. And I think like around this time, we also see a photo of Art Blank, and it turns out it's the same guy who had his mouth sewn yeah. shut at the beginning of the movie. And it's also revealed, too, that we have a few cutaways to Donnie Wahlberg and Hoffman in their trap. And their trap, they're basically on like a seesaw. Yes. And Wahlberg is chained and standing on top of a block of ice. That is, that is in all- front of heaters. And it's Yeah, and melting. when all the ice melts, then... Two giant blocks of ice. Well, no, the giant blocks of ice are are tied to something else. When all the ice melts... (laughs) The seesaw will tip, and all the water will rush to Hoffman's feet. Yeah, it's going to electrocute Hoffman. Yes. And we also have, like, a a system of computers set up in front of them, and we see a guy playing around with them. I... And and maybe around this time is, is when it's revealed that this is Art Blank with, like, scars all over his mouth. Yeah. Well, knowing what we know from all the previous Saw movies, especially the first one with Zep... Mm-hmm. At this point, we know, as viewers, Art Blank is not involved. He's being forced to do this. And Donnie Wahlberg kind of figures that out, too, when Art explains to him, literally, I'm part of this game, too. There's a guy coming to save all of us. 
you better hope he doesn't come through that door before the timer or something. Yeah, which we'll, we'll get back to that in a minute. This next test that, that Rig has to run to at the school where he beat the crap out of this dad, who also beat his wife, by the way, he shows up and the the trap has already, I guess, essentially ended, really. Yeah. The husband and wife are placed back to back and there's like metal spikes going through the husband and wife. Now they're going through the wife at not vital spots, but the yeah, husband they're going is through all vital, vital organs. organs of the husband. And in order to save herself, the woman needs to pull the spikes out through the both of them and she'll live mm -hmm. and the husband will die. And again, are you appreciating your life enough to leave your abusive husband? Like, why is she being punished? I know. I, th that's exactly what I thought, right? Yeah. There, there's no there's no rhyme or reason to it sometimes, right? Yeah, well, they're, they're kind of just hoping, I think, that you kind of overlook that. It's 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 a little bit worse. And I think the worst is, I think it's Saw 3D, where absolutely there's a woman, a wife of someone involved who Jigsaw knows was not at all complicit in the main guy's thing in the game, but she's still going to die if he doesn't do it. It's like, okay, now we're just punishing whoever the fuck we want. This is a little bit like that. Mm -hmm. And what's even kind of more interesting is that when Rig shows up, he's going to help the wife. But then he's just kind of like, hey, you need to help yourself, actually. Well, also, like, what can he do? You're right. I mean, I guess he could pull the rest of the metal spikes out, but he just drapes his coat over her to keep her warm. And he's like, you're going to have to save yourself. He does pull the fire alarm as he's leaving, so people will show up. Exactly. Though. Well, then the FBI and the cops show up, and I, I guess the wife is okay, but the husband's clearly dead. And there's a pointless but really cool scene where this crime scene photographer gets one oh, of these God, metal spikes yeah, about shot this. through her face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, complete, like, it's, it's like a crossbow kind of thing, and it's just like, they're they're literally dusting for prints, and it just goes off. And yeah, and it, it kills, kills her. It's like, oh. And then we get this kind of jarring scene where the FBI agents start kind of freaking out, and then they go out into the hallway, and they're looking around, and they find a room with the Jigsaw doll. What's it called? Billy. Billy the Puppet. So they find Billy sitting there, and there's a message for Agent Perez, and Billy says something like, Strom will kill an innocent man soon, and that your next steps are critical. And not heeding the double meaning of that last line, Perez gets too close to the doll, and its face explodes, sending yeah. shrapnel into her face. So she's rushed to the hospital, and is she alive? Like, does she show up in other movies, Patrick? I, I, but yeah, I believe she's alive okay. in the next one. Well, okay, now it's around this time in the movie that Strom is putting all the clues together, and he goes back to Jill, and he's like... You know Art, and your unborn son's name was Gideon, and there's a picture of Art and Jigsaw shaking hands in front of this factory called Gideon Meatpacking. He's like, what's with the pig mass? And then, yeah. and then I love I love this exchange. She's like, are you familiar with the Chinese Zodiac? And then uh, he's, go, he's like, like, oh, oh no, God. Jill, come on. Like, like a, a, the absolutely the appropriate reaction when you get that kind of bullshit response. But <laughs> Year of the Pig... Gideon was going to be born in the year of the pig, so we get some retroactive explanation of why there's... I'm sure it's just pig masks because they're kind of creepy and they're, you know, we just yeah, they're gross. buy them somewhere, right? And and then, but now it's, oh, okay, that's why the pigs. And that's that was always a very unsatisfying explanation. And I liked how in Spiral, that movie, it's all about, like, police brutality and stuff. The pig masks make a lot more sense in that movie. Okay. No, no, here's the thing. We don't need explanation for the pig mask no, either, no, it's just but if creepy. you're going to give it, can we get something better than Year of the Pig? Come on, that's, <laughs> that's all I ask. So at, at this point, Strom is going to head to this meatpacking factory, and Rig is also headed there. Now, as you had briefly mentioned earlier, there's a bit that's set up where if Rig comes through the front door, it will set off like a trap or it's going to like hit like a lever or something and these two giant blocks of ice are going to come down and crush Donnie Wahlberg's head. So the lawyer, the Scarface lawyer, is like, you better hope he doesn't come through that front door. Well, what did we learn earlier in the movie, Patrick? That he has a habit of busting through <laughs> <laughs> unsafe so, doors. so stupid, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Strom shows up to the factory I don't know if he gets turned around or if he's like looking for, for everybody, but he somehow stumbles upon Jeff and he walks into the room. He sees a dead jigsaw. And, and this is when you as an audience member are kind of confused because you're like, wait, I thought this already all already happened. Even before that, there's, yeah, there's a few shots of just like, as he's going through these hallways, we also see Jeff wandering around and it's like, oh, that guy. Okay. What, yeah. What, what, we're doing this. And then it's like, and I, I, I just picture someone watching this didn't see saw three it's like who the fuck is that guy we haven't seen him the entire movie 
Yeah. But that's your fault. These Saw movies are, in their own way, they're very complicated. They're all intertwined, and you, you need to keep up. You need to watch all of them to make sense of any of them. That's kind of one thing that's actually kind of frustrating about the Saw series, but it's one thing that I really respect, too, the interweaving story. Yes, it's frustrating because it's bullshit to have a twist ending be like, oh, this was actually taking place back <laughs> then, but it's also neat that, yeah. again, this makes it seem like it was more thought out than I'm sure it was. Yes, 100%. Yeah. So Strom runs into the room. Jeff is there. And Strom looks at a dead jigsaw and a bunch of dead people all over the place. And that and Jeff's wife with her head blown up. And Jeff's like, where's my daughter? Because remember, the daughter yes. is captive. Yeah. And then Strom goes, what are you talking about? And then he just immediately shoots him. <laughs> Well, because he's holding a gun or yeah. some, he's holding some weapon. I don't remember if it's a gun because he slits Jigsaw's throat with like a saw. So he might be holding that. I don't remember. But he just shoots him dead. So Jigsaw's prediction was right there. And then while that's going on, Rig shows up and you have Donnie Wahlberg, who's been given a gun by the lawyer with one shot in it. Rig is like approaching the door and the timer's quickly counting down. Like they're, they're almost at zero. And Donnie Wahlberg starts yelling. He's like, don't come through the door. Don't come through the door. And then Rig starts to run at the door and Donnie Wahlberg shoots, misses him. And no, he hits him. Oh, he, he does just does, okay, isn't yeah. able to stop him. He just kind of sends him to the ground, but he, but he's come through the door at that point. Yeah. And he busts through the door. And as he does that, these two giant blocks of ice come down and crush Donnie Wahlberg's head, which is pretty cool literally it's you're underselling it it is one of the most amazing things <laughs> i've ever seen it is so satisfying it's dumb but it's amazing this is listen <laughs> i really enjoy donnie Wahlberg and saw too i think he's awesome it's 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 a bit frustrating that especially because he's just kind of been in captivity these past two movies that we've basically got a donnie Wahlberg trilogy here and it's <laughs> now it's the only time it's really satisfying isn't that for the first time when he's like the main character and he's heavily involved but this the finality of the donny Wahlberg storyline oh it's amazing is amazing <laughs> to end it in that way is awesome it's the best moment of the movie it's one of the best moments of the series yeah and, then, and i just love how chaotic it all is so donny Wahlberg's head is exploded by ice oh yeah there's like 10 important things that happen all in these like three seconds here yeah and then the scale immediately tips and you and it looks like hoffman's gonna be electrocuted rig shoots the lawyer and the lawyer i think shoots him back or something i don't know but the lawyer's like you No, i I don't think he shoot i don't think he no the lawyer i don't think shoots him i think he's he's just he's been shot by donnie that's that's why that's right yeah and then the lawyer's like you idiot and rig's like oh you've got them you've got them captive he's like it's not me this is part of your test this is this was part of your test or something he's yelling and then as he's it looks like he's reaching into his pocket to pull out a gun i I think rig shoots him a couple more times and then you see it's like just once i think i think he just blasts him through the head listen the whole end was so exciting i'm just misremembering it all oh sure yeah that's fair (laughs) and he pulls out a tape recorder and jigsaw is telling him something i forget what it is maybe you remember but uh... (laughs) (laughs) i haven't seen this movie in a couple weeks actually but (laughs) oh no i remember what he says he's like okay he says something to the effect of like this was your game you had to learn to let people die and then we get the flashbacks of you know you know (laughs) You know, never to go through an unsecured yeah. door. Don't go through that door. Like all the, because yeah. it's in this is when the music is hyping up, right? Yeah. So then all that's great. And then in the background, you see uh, Hoffman get up out of his chair. He's in fact not electrocuted. And this is when you learn. Yeah, I do, I do think he pretended to be electrocuted in that you said it looks like he's going to be. I think he did the full, you know, <laughs> shake him around like he was being electrocuted, but I don't, can't confirm that. He walks over and you realize, oh my God, Hoffman's the strong apprentice who could lift <laughs> Detective Carey. <laughs> he's not the strong apprentice. He's not an apprentice strong, to strong. Strong apprentice. Yeah, no, I know, I know, I know what you said, yeah. <laughs> I don't remember. I think he just watches Rig die or he kills Rig or something. Yeah, but I think he kind of just leaves Rig to die. Yeah, and then he just the walks big thing the is room. he goes and locks the makeshift hospital room lock it or yeah he, he goes he strom goes up behind there. strom and just closes the door and locks it mm-hmm. and walks away that's the end of the movie patrick what'd you think of saw 4 <laughs> listen it's not a great movie but it's an improvement over saw 3 I, th- I think when i look at saw 3 i see a lot of missed opportunity i don't see missed opportunity with saw 4 i just see you know it's not a great movie but saw 3 the missed opportunities of we have jigsaw alive and we have Amanda alive. We can do something with these two characters, and we just don't. Actually, by the way, Saw X, 
does that. Oh, Saw X okay. gave me all that I wanted out of those two characters that I didn't get from Saw 3. So just a, another little point about Saw X, which is the best of the series, as I mentioned. Saw 4? Oh, well, actually, one thing you you missed from the end was that you get... And this is one of the best things about the, about the movie. So the overall ending, two twists, three, tw- three twists, really. This is all happening before the end of Saw 3, or like right at the end of Saw 3, basically. Yes, yeah. So that's a twist. A little bullshit. The other one is we have another accomplice. A little bullshit because we barely know who Hoffman is. It's like, okay, this guy that had like two or three lines in Saw 3 and a couple lines early on in this movie, and then he's just in a chair the rest of the movie. Like, <laughs> oh, he's the accomplice. Like, we barely know him. That, that, that twist doesn't really work for me. What does work is then we go back to him at the autopsy listening to the tape, Mm -hmm. and suddenly everything that Jigsaw is telling him that's directed at Hoffman is recontextualized. Yes. This isn't a challenge to the police in general, like, oh, I'm not done. This isn't over. It's, this isn't over, Hoffman. You still have stuff you need to do for me. Mm -hmm. That I like quite a bit. So I just wanted to clean that up a bit. But as for what I really liked, I liked... Did this movie put some people in traps that absolutely deserve to die? I thought that, and it kind of goes with the context of you're not really supposed to save anyone. I mean, some of the people, like, absolutely you should save, but, like, that pervert guy, like, <laughs> eh, you know. I like that. And, and again, thinking of it in relation to Saw 3. Saw 3, more emotional storyline with the guy in the game, but at the same time, Jeff was such a miserable character to root for. I think Rig... There's less to him in his character, but easier to root for just because he's not a complete fucking incompetent piece of shit. <laughs> I do think we could, the movie could have been better if there was more to his character, though. Yeah, I agree. A lot of the traps I liked, a lot of the, you know, the Donnie Wahlberg death is one for the ages, of course. <laughs> I know, I wrote that down on my list as one of my favorite kills this season. <laughs> oh yeah, so that, that that's getting a nomination for sure. And we talked about this a lot. We had a nice little discussion at the end of Saw 3 that made its way onto YouTube if you want to check it out. But we kind of talked about, okay, if we were in charge of the Saw series after Saw 3, Jigsaw's dead, what do you do? And we had some interesting discussions. And I kind of said, I would like to go the way that they did with Spiral. Just kind of leave the Jigsaw character and have someone else doing like a similar thing. We also said, like, okay, you could pick up with Jeff, I guess, but Jeff sucks, so we don't really <laughs> want to do that. And here we do pick up with Jeff, but for no longer than we need to. Yeah, for we 10 seconds. We just kind of end his storyline as as we are introduced to him in this movie, which is great. And then they obviously ended up going with another accomplice. They went with that route, which is a little frustrating, but this is where the series truly understands what it is. And now, granted, this isn't as good as some of the earlier movies, i.e. 1 and 2. But this is where we establish, okay, these movies are all interconnected from now on. Any character we meet who shows up in the next movie might be an accomplice. <laughs> Any, uh, you know, the wife's going to be back, obviously. And then also we're doing flashbacks to get Tobin Bell involved. This this is the movie where they truly understand that the Saw series is one of the preeminent dramas of our time in terms of just the complicated story. And, and the complications are mostly bullshit, but <laughs> the film's committed to them in a way that I respect. And yeah, I, I like this movie. I, it's not great. It's not as good as the first two Saw movies. It has a lot of problems that we talked about. I definitely like this one more than Saw 3. Again, it's very far from perfect. There's no perfect Saw movie. Even Saw X has I have some issues with. Uh, but I do, I do want to hear your take on it. I mean, overall, you're less into the Saw movies than I am. And I understand that the Saw movies, for me, were an acquired taste. First, I kind of hate watched them. Then I grew to kind of appreciate how dumb the storytelling is and how we're constantly getting flashbacks. Oh, one thing we didn't point out, and this is a little detail that I like, when John Kramer is waiting outside his wife's clinic... A uh, hooker walks up to him and says, hey, you know, fancy a night? And he's like, you're, you're a good looking girl. Why don't you go home? That's actually one of the ladies in the house and saw too. So there's like little details oh. like that throughout the series, which are kind of neat. And again, you do kind of have to see all the movies to understand any one of them to a certain extent. And that is frustrating and stupid. But it's also rewarding if you watch all of them because then you'll notice things like that. And like, oh, that's who that person is. Oh, that's great. That's it's nice. I like it. I like Saw 4. Jim, what about you? Yeah, I think I like Saw 4 too. I think I still like the first one the most. Oh, for sure. So, so, so the first Saw is a more satisfying vision of a movie. 
Yeah, but the stuff with this that I liked was, like, I, I liked the traps more than Saw 3 and 2, I think. I, I didn't really like the character of Rig and, and making him such a central point to this. Or part yeah, of the I think they I think they could have done something more with him. I, th- I think they could have just beefed up his character because, in again, in the previous Saw movies, he's just kind of guy. He's SWAT team guy. Mm-hmm. Oh, he's kind of our main character in this movie. You think we would take the time to do a little bit more with this character. We really don't. And that's 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 a misstep. Yeah, I mean, for me, most of the characters are nobodies that I either didn't notice in the previous movies or didn't care to notice. I do like how kind of, I don't want to use the word religious, but it's kind of in that same vein, how um, committed Jigsaw is to his beliefs. I do like all that kind of like religious-esque. I I think religious is a good term because there's this like hypocrisy and there is this just like total commitment to it, even when facing the reality that your philosophy doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, I mean, there's the whole, like, with religion, it's like, at the end of the day, it comes down to faith. And so you're going to say, like, logically, this doesn't mean, okay, sure. But, like, Jigsaw doesn't have the excuse of faith, I guess. But it's just like, again, the first thing he does, the first person he puts through a trap is the guy that kills his baby. And he puts him in a trap. And then he's like, if you survive, you'll be instantly rehabilitated. And then the guy survives because the trap falls apart. And then he immediately <laughs> goes to try and kill Jigsaw, as you would. Yeah. And then, again, Jigsaw kind of sidesteps him and he just falls in a bunch of barbed wire and presumably dies. But I don't ultimately know, and maybe it changes movie to movie, I don't ultimately know how the series feels about the fact that, yeah, actually this doesn't rehabilitate people. Because in Saw 1, it's established Amanda survived her thing and then danny glover weirdly asks like are you rehabilitated or something it's like why would he ask that that's that shouldn't be important to him but she says yes then it's also also revealed in saw two and three that she went she reverted back to drugs and she's working with jigsaw so she has at least enough belief in the process that it can help people yeah, and that she I wants so. to serve <laughs> the person that's carrying out this vision, but she also, her personal problems with drugs continue to resurface. There's a great moment. Again, I keep mentioning Saw, the final chapter, Saw 3D. There is a great moment where they have like a jigsaw support group, which I, which one is a fun <laughs> idea that, that, that there's, that at this point, there's this many people that have been put through traps all in this one city that we can have support groups of like survivors and stuff. Conceit of that movie is one of the guys who's saying he's a jigsaw survivor actually wasn't a part of that and he's just trying to make money off of it. So he's speaking at this group about how he is rehabilitated and then one lady who had to chop off her own arm is like what the fuck are you talking about like look what (laughs) happened to my actually come to think of it i think there is a moment like that in the support group i'm actually thinking of a different scene in one of the other saw movies where a survivor from the trap is in the hospital bed and hoffman is talking to her and he's like did it work out or something and she's like look at my fucking arm like what am i going to do and and then i I, maybe it's even the same character but in the saw support group she's She's like, the only thing I got out of this is handicapped parking. And it's like, I, I love that they <laughs> that some movies draw attention to how bullshit this philosophy is, but not all the movies do. Ultimately, I don't know how the series actually feels about that. I do think it's kind of frustrating. Most of the characters seem to think like, oh yeah, no, his philosophy is he doesn't kill people. He lets them make decisions. It's like, okay, but even in this movie, the first trap, someone had to die. Yeah. Already, the, the wife and husband... Whether she pulls those spikes out or not, those are through vital organs in the husband. He's not going to make it, so someone's dying. Yeah. Let me ask you, which movie did you like better? Friday the 13th Part 4, The Final Chapter, or Saw 4? It's Friday the 13th, The Final Chapter. I like Saw 4 for what it is, but like I said, Friday the 13th, The Final, the final Chapter is just about a perfect slasher movie. It's so, so good, and it's really entertaining, and I can revisit it all the time. Jim, what about you? I agree with you. I think... Well, actually, if I'm going to be honest, Saw 4 really grosses me out. And that's why I'm picking yeah, and that, and that's fair. 13th Part 4. And the, and the story is really confusing and kind of bullshitty. Sure. So how do you think these two films stack up as a drive-in double feature? I mean, I think they stack up pretty well. There are similarities between the two, like, <laughs> like more scenes. Corner. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And both movies either take place directly after the events of the previous movie or like during. Or directly before or during. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. it's it's confusing when it comes to software. Yeah. Yeah, so that's kind of neat. I'll agree that it's a good double feature. You know, film has changed. Horror has changed as a genre in in the 22, 23 years between these movies. Friday the 13th was kind of the saw of its day. It got the same kind of critical disdain. You know, they didn't use the word 
phrase torture porn back then but Mm -hmm. really these these friday the 13th movies and slasher movies just more broadly were viewed as just trash irredeemable (laughs) trash and i think you have a very good example of yeah maybe it's a little irredeemable but it's harmless fun and then saw four little bit more disgusting yeah well a lot more disgusting in terms of the film like the stuff that happens in the film but as far as like it's it's not my thing as much as it is in the 80s but there's this similarity i guess just in terms of how the series is the two series are received and i don't know if saw 4 is one of the better saw movies but it's at least not one of the worst ones i don't think and friday the 13th the final chapter it's a cool 90 minutes probably even a little bit less then you go into you know we got donnie Wahlberg's head being crushed by a couple <laughs> blocks of ice that's as good as anything in the final chapter a lot of kills, a lot of violence, a lot of gore. And the movies are in similar spirits in that sense. So I think it works. I like both movies. I think it's a good double feature. I agree with you on all your points, my friend. So this is what we're doing next. We've got a couple like major A-list blockbuster type movies here because we've got Back to the Future and we've got Scream. <laughs> wow. And more Crispin Glover next episode. That's fun. <laughs> Always good with more Crispin Glover. <laughs> we'll see you next time.